Good morning, everyone. Welcome to lesson seven. This is your final lesson in the course, and it's on reputation management. And we are going to jump right in. Okay. So online reputation management. Let's look into that, right? So of course, we'll always start with a definition. And today the definition is from Technopedia. Guys, there are so many good resources online where you can find simple explanations for things in the digital or tech space that you don't understand. Don't be afraid to Google. All right. And so when we talk about uh, online reputation or reputation management, what we're talking about is a strategy. And I want you guys to realize that it's all strategy okay so strategies that shape or influence the public's perception of an organization individual or other entity on the internet so online reputation is how you are perceived on the internet and it helps drive public opinion about a business and its product and services okay so now notice i said perception not truth it's about how you are perceived. The truth of it is another matter altogether, right? So let's look at some keywords. Shape or influence, right? So it's a strategy to influence or shape how the public perceives. You know, guys, I talk all the time about conditioning your audience and conditioning your audience. And this is really what I mean, or uh, some of what I mean. Conditioning um, your audience to think the way you think about your own brand. You want them to see your brand, your business from your perspective, right? So you are creating narratives around your brand or business, and we call that message messaging around your brand or your business to uh to get the public to think of the brand in the way that you want them to think of the brand right so you're you're using messaging or it's a strategy um and through messaging you're shaping and you're influencing the public's perception now perception doesn't mean it is true perception doesn't mean it is false Perception, again, is just that narrative that you are creating because you want people to see you a particular way. And what you don't want is for them to have to figure that out themselves or come to a conclusion themselves because you may not like the conclusion they come to. So you're going to have a lot of work to do to, again, shape or influence the way they think about you, your brand, your product, your service. And all of these things have to do um, are correlated. How they think about your brand is going to affect how they think about your product and service. It's going to affect how they think about you. And, you know, let me start over. How they think about you is going to affect what they think about your brand and your product and your services, right? Public opinion. Now, it doesn't matter if it's your target audience or just general Joe Blow on the internet. Everybody is going to have an opinion, right? Um, and what you're trying to do is as best as possible, um, do things or create messaging, you know, or practices, because it's not just messaging, it's actually how you behave on the um, online platforms as well, that's gonna um, affect public opinion or shape or influence public opinion, right? So guys, again, want you to realize too that online reputation is a strategy, is part of a customer service strategy as well to kind of condition the public to think a certain way about you, your product, your service, et cetera. And it's especially important online, and we're going to see why. So the biggest thing there was the perception, your brand perception. But what do we mean when we say brand perception? So it is not only what your company says it represents, it's what your customers believe your product, services, and company as a whole represents. Remember I said just now, how they think about you will affect how they think about your brand, your products, your services, et cetera. Even in instances where you as the owner don't appear online, they probably don't even know who the owner is. If they formulate opinions about the kind of person who would own a brand like this, 
and that opinion is bad, it's going to affect everything else. Or if that opinion is good, it's going to affect everybody else. But the reason why online reputation is so important, especially as related to perception, is because a lot of the times, if you're going online, there is a humanizing process that you're going to have to do, right? Because it's, especially if you're on social media platforms, you're, you're trying to be social. So whether you're a small business owner, or so, there's going to be some human facing person that's representing the brand in some way, at least I hope, right? And if that is the case, then that person has to be likable because that is the person who is now the face of the brand. And if that person is not likable, then we're going to have a problem, right? So that's, a, that's one reason why online reputation is so important. But the biggest reason, the biggest reason why online reputation is so important is because it spread so fast. It is instant. Somebody leaves a bad review on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, it is instantly picked up. It's something that people have quick and ready access to and people love to screenshot things and save them. So even if you're not deleted, believe me, somebody already screenshot it and that's gonna start making the wrongs online. Okay, so you have to be extremely careful with that because one, consumers have all the power online and they can make or break your brand. And uh, feedback, negative or positive, will have instant effect um, on your brand in the online space. So that's the number one reason why online reputation is important and why brand perception, especially online, is so important, right? So what does brand perception affect? When we say brand perception, what are we talking about? We're talking about your identity. We're talking about the messaging or the tone. We are talking about representations. So what does your brand represent and who are, what or who does your brand represent? What is your brand trying to say? Who is your brand aligning itself with or what um, message is your brand aligning itself with? Remember the whole Black Lives Matter movement, brands were scrambling over themselves to come and proclaim that they're pro-Black and all Black Lives Matter, right? Um, that's because they're trying to align themselves with a particular messaging. They're trying to show themselves as being inclusive and representing diversity, all right? So that's important because the brands that didn't got choked on the internet. They got severe backlash on the internet and many brands were forced to take that position, even if they didn't, or even if they didn't want to get involved, not, there's no such thing as not getting involved when you're in the online space. Even influencers got caught up in that because persons were realizing that, oh, but you have a large black following, but here you are not saying anything about the Floyd Green issue. Here you are not saying anything about police brutality issue. And now I'm looking at you sideways because are you really for us or do you just want our money? Do you just want our attention so you can get sponsors? And so a lot of brands came under scrutiny during that whole movement because of what they represent or the silence about what they represent. You cannot be a silent brand online in terms of that. It's also about how the customer or the client or the public experiences your brand. That's very important. If they have negative experiences with your brand, that's going to form associations. And if what is associated with your brand is negative experiences, then your brand perception is gonna drop and your online reputation is going to be dust, right? So you, you have to take those things in mind. And when I talk about, and I want, let me go back, because when I talk about identity, what I'm talking about is literally how you physically look to the public online. That's important. And I realize that when, you, when you're producing content for digital platforms, if your content don't look a particular way or come across as quality to people, you will not get that same level of engagement. At one point, if your profile wasn't aesthetically pleasing to people where you have some tile background or some pattern or some something going on that enhances the aesthetic appeal of your page, you'll have less, you'll have people spending less time on your page. Identity is very important. 
So when we talk about color psychology, whether your brand is red or yellow or blue, or what does these things represent? It's a subconscious thing, right? And it forms part of your identity. And there's so many associations that come along with that. Now, why do I have a Black Bear phone right here, sir? You guys remember when Black Bear phone was the phone that you needed to have? And if you can't send a Black Bear message, then you are not that girl, right? You remember that? <laughs> Blackberry at the time was a status symbol, right? And if you weren't carrying a Blackberry, you weren't in a particular club, right? Now, nobody cares about a Blackberry. Nobody cares about a Blackberry. In fact, I think Blackberry shut down a, a couple of years ago. They, they, they literally tacked a couple of years ago for many reasons, including them being too elitist to realize what was happening. Elitist is my word to, or let's say slow, because they were elitist, to realize what was happening in the, 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 the smartphone space. And so they didn't adapt and they kept the buttons. Um, one of the reasons is that they kept the buttons on the phone and people were like, no, we want the touch pipe thing. And it, it's so many reasons why the business failed. But at one point, Blackberry was the iPhone. If you never had a Blackberry, the iPhone wasn't even that hype in Jamaica at the time. If you never had a blackberry you're not, you're not saying nothing right it was um and it was about the perception of the brand because blackberry started out as a brand for executives and it was very exclusive very premium and if you weren't an uh, executive that drive around in a a, a volvo right <laughs> or one of them ex, what i call executive looking mercedes benzies with a blackberry you weren't you are you really even and so that kind of trickled down into the regular public and the perception stuck, right? So look at backstory on, on that bear. But we're gonna look at some local brands and perceptions around local brands. So these, the, the perception about this brand, and this is another thing to note, even if your brand started offline, or even if you have an offline brand, Sometimes the reputation of your brand offline will follow you online because people think to, people seem to think online is an alternate reality or universe. It is not. Uh, it's people who are online or using these online services and they will remember if your brand was good or not good. And then when you come into the digital space and try to recreate the brand as if we don't have memories, then you're going to run into problems. So let's talk about some brands whose reputation preceded them and not in the best way. And everybody here, I don't care how old you are, knows about cable and wireless and the whole trauma, that generational trauma of cable and wireless and Jamaicans. So Prior to 1999, the Jamaica telecommunications sector was dominated by one company for over 30 odd years. We suffered with cable and wireless, right? Until, uh, well, in 1988, the company was granted five exclusive licenses and each of those licenses lasted for 25 years, yeah? Which would and that so that means the, the licenses will be valid until 2013 and could have been extended for another 25 years. The long and short of this is it made them the sole provider of the island's domestic and international telephone service and guaranteed. Guaranteed. No, Jamaica was always a free market kind of society since independence. So I don't know what this guarantee thing is, but they were guaranteed an after tax rate of rate of return of 75%. Pretty much they were guaranteed profit. And so whatever they had to do to make the profit, they made a profit and trust and believe they made profit. Okay. And so the minister responsible for telecommunication had the authority to establish minimum standards of service quality. Skipping down further, in an effort to develop a competitive and vibrant telecommunications industry because cable and wireless was getting backlash. I mean, generational backlash, right? And to move Jamaica towards knowledge-based connected society, 
they liberalized, liberalized the telecommunication sector in 1999. And if you guys, you know, sometimes it's good to be a student of history because then you can understand why certain things play out the way they play out in our society now because of things that happened before. So um, I don't know how many of you here would be in the age group where you remember this happening. I, I, I wouldn't say I remember it happening, but I sure um, know about this and the, the, the running that happened after that. We had Claro. Anybody remember Claro? We had Claro. We had all sorts of different things uh, happening at the time. But when Cable and Wireless exited, Cable and Wireless didn't actually exit it. What they did was they rebranded and they rebranded to Lime. And Lime was actually a play on the word Lime, L Y M E, which meant hanging out with your friends, you know, chilling. So this was the announcement. Uh, I think this was back in 2008. This was the announcement today and going forward. We are no longer Kevin Wireless, said country manager Tony Rich. Friday, Friday, we're Lime, right? The name changed to Lime, an acronym for Landline Internet Mobile Entertainment. Now, before you only got the landline, the land right? I had to pay an arm and a leg and sacrifice your firstborn child to pay the bills, okay? Um, and he said, it's not just a rebranding exercise, wink, wink, but also a company transformation, right? And he says, and this is how the new brand line tried to separate itself from cable and wireless that suffered really bad reputational damage for years and they did not care. But, you know, now they're trying to clean up their act and now, oh no, we're a new and different business with a new and different approach, he said. It's about changing the way we do business and how we operate, right? Um, and then he went on to say, even our language is going to change. Our posture is going to change. How we relate to customers will change. And everybody was like, okay, all right. New business culture. Lime will bring with it a new business culture. It doesn't really bear, look at the separation. It doesn't really bear a lot of resemblance to Cable and Wireless. He said, Lime is not Cable and Wireless, right? We'll do, and they're going to do away with this. No, this is them telling on themselves. What, listen to this line. Mr. Abdinor said, Lime will do away with the stuffy slow moving and reactive culture of cable and wireless. So them did no more, them did no more, right? And replace it with a younger, proactive and fun, fun. Anytime a business tell you that they have a fun culture, people, people going home hungry. People going home hungry and it's a nightmare, right? That focus on the customer. Okay, all right. And the name line, which was suggested by a cable wireless employee, don't believe that, but okay, is even associated with good times and socializing. All right, line. Now, in 2008, it was created in 2008, replaced line. And look at now, this is a newspaper article clip from the Cleveland. Read what it says, which had become synonymous with bite service and was often referred to tongue in cheek as careless and whatness. Y'all remember that cable and whatness, careless and whatness? <laughs> Even the newspapers know it was a common sentiment. Nobody liked cable and wireless, right? But then for some reason, line was just not cutting it either because the new fun culture wasn't fun for anybody at all right and then live customers started to have problems and at this time digicel had entered the scene and jamaicans were flocking to digicel because they were like okay no mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. y'all not y'all y'all you can't trick me 
was the response from Jamaica, right? But then flow was always there. But remember that flow was an internet service before, right? And then cable and wireless sold out. So money for selling out, they were not selling out, as in they sold the business and had different management and blah, blah, blah. And they took over the business that owned flow. Yeah. And they decided that they were going to merge everything into one and Lime became flow, right? Why? Because Lime customers were not happy. And even Lime customers said they preferred, they, 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 they rated our rank flow higher in terms of brand positivity. And what, that, what, they, what are they talking about? They're talking about including innovation, value for money, customer focus, and going the extra mile, right? Uh, according to Silvera, flow customers already have a strong brand image association. Now, look at what they were trying to do. They acquired flow. They could have kept line, but they acquired flow. Why? Again, rebranding. Flow had a better brand image, a better reputation, a better brand perception, and they wanted to capitalize off of that. And so they wanted to get rid of line. Lime, it came down, then everything was the line came down so fast, right? And then flow, nice blue, pretty blue means, blue is a very corporate color, but look at the shade of blue. It's, it's, it's fun, it's more techy looking, yeah? It is more fresh, more hip. Look at how the logo is with the little curves in it and stuff, yeah man, them hip to the thing, you know? Yeah, okay. Um, so flow had positive attributes, forward thinking, progressive. Like I said, hit progressive. A brand I can associate with and it's customer focused, yeah? Fast forward. Oh, so another quote, the vibrant people. So this is what flow was supposed to represent. Vibrant people, limitless passion and drive to succeed are characteristics displayed not only by the Jamaican community, but by the region as a whole, because Cabral Warriors had a stranglehold on the region, right? So, and then line came in. So this is a regional thing, not just Jamaica, right? Um, we find motivation in those attributes, which will be reflected by our principle, focus on innovation, technical excellence, and outstanding customer service. Stick up in on that last one, okay? Fast forward to this, right? And flow not living up to any of the hype. Now remember, before Cable and Wireless took over flow, although technically it wasn't Cable and Wireless because the company was bought out, right? But honestly, Everybody still consider these brands owned by Kibla Wireless, even though they're not. But the perception has followed the brand. The name Kibla Wireless, no matter how much time they try to shake it, will not shake. It's stuck, right? And I think what happened is that the perception stuck, and it and it, they were unless they shut down the company and come back again as a whole new company and we don't know that it was associated with the other company, the perception followed. And I don't think Flo had a chance. I don't think Flo had a chance because people had long memories and people had trauma, PTSD <laughs> from these companies before. And they're like, they were automatically skeptical about this thing, right? And then, because the culture actually did not change, the same behavior from Cable and Wireless came over with Lime and now came over with Flow. And so you get, <laughs> you get reviews like this, terrible company. And look at what this reviewer said. First it was Cable and Wireless, then it was Lime, now it's Flow. Well, they bought Flow and have messed it up like they mess up everything. Now, if that isn't telling you about the public's perception and opinion about this company, you could have changed your branding look more. Whether you want to be hip and technologically advanced, people are going to always associate you 
right? With Kira Wallace, that's just that's just what it is. Uh, so let's look at some more hair views because I thought these were hilarious. Now this is on Twitter, and this was just like two years ago. This was in 2020. I want to know how to get a refund on poor service. Like yesterday, a whole lady internet down and no SMS message sent to customers. No, guys, Kira Wallace was notorious for services being down. Notorious. And it's still happening. Somebody says, welcome to the stock. No internet in my whole community for four days. Also, nobody pays us any mind. They just stop answering the phone. And somebody says, I would like to report a crime. Bad internet service. And, and it just went on and on and on. So last year, K Brown Wireless literally exited the stock market. Uh, and notice what it says, with a checkered reputation from his past days as a powerful telephone monopoly, would have celebrated 30 years as a listed company. Instead, the current owner of the company that has gone through various name changes, rebrandings, and takeovers over time has formally told the Jamaica Stock Exchange that it will delist CWD stock this week. So in effect, there is no more cable and wireless in Jamaica. However, the perception from back in those days persists. And cable flow, flow can't catch a break. But if they had done what they said they would have done in terms of improving their customer service, in terms of changing the culture, all that good stuff, they would not have had this problem. And even with very strong competition from Digicel, the problems persisted. And we can talk about whether Digicel is better or not better, but what we, what we, what we have to admit is that they completely changed the, the telecommunications game and for many years enjoyed a good reputation, whether deserved or not deserved, just because people were opposed to, to cable and wireless. All right. And now that there is not that opposition anymore to cable and wireless and the sentiments around it are not as strong, people are going, but did you say, you, you, you're not really going with nothing, neither. That's a whole other, that's a whole other class. Let me go to your comments and see what, uh, <laughs> see what you guys are saying. <laughs> I experienced that for four months in 2019. Four did not care. Kada, you still call it? Yeah, she still call them CNW. People care about the service product. That's what we're paying for. I still use the three names interchangeably. People still do. Um, um, they need to change even if buildings there. If, if the reputation, the reputational damage is so strong that it will i don't think it will ever leave them and i don't think there's nothing i don't think there's anything flo can do um to really change that because people are gonna always they're gonna always get the side eye people are always go mm -hmm. all right all right it's i think i think it's irreparable at this point and then the service is not good the socials are not that great i mean even though they are now online, even though they are now trying to build a reputation in the online space, nothing, dust, <laughs> right? All right, guys, so let's move. I told you it was going to be juicy. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> All right, so the biggest problem with Flow is their customer service. That's what people complain about all the time. And at first it was, I'm calling and no, but if you guys can get flow on the phone or have some kind of magic, can't get them on the phone. And so people turn to the online space. So flow is on every single platform. And you think messaging, messaging them on the platform would help. Good luck, good luck with that. I mean, they respond, but is the response helpful for another story altogether? All right. So what people know or believe about an organization is critical to their responses. Now, this is a, because guys, as I said, I love researching and I'm always reading research people and I found this one, the link between service quality, corporate reputation and customer responses um, by Jean Kim. 
the correct pronouns there, right? And he says, John says, what people know or believe about an organization is critical to how they respond to that organization and how they come to de define themselves in relation to it. Think about how people think about cable and wireless flow line. On the same thing, on a different, on a not, do nothing um, different. On a, people think they're oppressive in how they respond. People think they don't care. That's the kind of reputation that they have, and that's how people respond to them. It's not a situation where, hey guys, you know, my service was done. What's going on? It's every time, every time my service always done. One, it's always an aggressive approach because they're, that's how they respond to the company because of the trauma, I call it trauma, <laughs> that we have experienced coming all the way from cable and wireless, right? So it says in order to lead to a favorable customer response and manage favorable relationships, companies should be aware of what associations made with the company are appealing or unappealing to customers. You cannot tell me that Flo is not aware that people think they're just absolutely rubbish at customer service and even worse at providing the actual service that you're paying for. They, it cannot, I, I refuse to believe that they don't know that people think that they're, uh, I don't want to say, let's say pricey, expensive, unnecessarily expensive. And the T word comes up a lot when my father looks at his bill, right? Um, and so, what have they done? What, have, what has Flo done to counteract this unfavorable or unappealing perception that the customer has? I cannot point to anything. No, they say and they keep saying that they're improving their customer service. But the reality on the ground or the, the perception on the ground is that that has not happened because literally nothing has changed, right? So Kim goes on to say, this raises the issue of companies needing to understand how their customers construct their perceptions of them. And I will go for it to say, if the perception is historical, if the perception is generational, it is going to be much harder for if it's bad. It's going to be much harder for that company to counteract, but it's not impossible. Because remember, Line people said they preferred flow. Everybody was good with flow. When flow was run by a different company, great brand perception. Why is it that that was not strong enough to counteract the bad perception? One, flow was a relatively new company. They didn't have a lot of years in the space. There was not, not much controversy around them. They did not have a history. Let's just say that. As opposed to <clears throat> this company that had years building up that bad reputation. But not only that, flow could have still sprinkled its magical reputation um, on, on the whole thing if they had actually understood or taken into account more how their customers construct their perceptions of them. And I'm wondering who is doing the marketing over there, but you know, I'm actually sorry for who's doing the marketing over there because marketing can only do so much. You can do so, uh, just so many giveaways. You can sponsor only so many things. You can pretty things up and do pretty graphics and you can have um, Gracie in all your ads because people love spice. It is not gonna help because the fundamental issues that they're having with shapes and influences, remember, how customers construct their perception of them has not changed. And that should be a lesson to everybody about brand perception, all right? So let's talk about the intersectionality between customer experience and reputation. And literally I'm talking about where they cross. Right? And it's simple. Better experiences and or interactions lead to better customer perceptions or experiences, right? Which lead to better brand rating, which leads to better social proofing, proofing which lead to best, better customer retention and easier customer acquisition. 
And what does all of this uh, uh, um, add up to? A better customer experience. And that's and that's the that's the uh that's where these two things intersect, right? Customer experience can have an effect on reputation, but reputation also affects how the customer experiences you. And that's what we were saying, that's what Kim was saying before, right? Sometimes, and that's why you have the saying your reputation precedes you. Because then people already start formulating ideas of you before they even actually met you. And depending on what that reputation was that preceded you, you they're already going to have a certain way that they're going to approach you. It may not be the way you want them to approach you, okay? So this is an excerpt I found from a book, and it was talking about cable wireless. And it says, the role of companies has been as important as that of the state in much of the Caribbean, right? The Cable and Wireless Corporation has dominated the telecommunications industry in Jamaica for a century and has attempted to retain various privileges associated with its monopoly. Not surprisingly, it has come to be regarded as impeding the development of the telecommunications industry. And uh, this perception proved decisive when it came face to face with the modernizing commercial strategy adopted by who? Digicel. Yes, a cell phone company capitalizing on its success in developing media in Ireland, for those who didn't know, it's an Irish company, in entering the Caribbean market. Um, uh, so it, it continues. But what this article is pretty much saying is that Cable and Wireless suffered because they were so to respond, right? BlackBerry, and they did not, they did not take into account how they were being perceived and impact that would have because they thought they would have always had this privilege, but they were forced because the minister talking about wanting to liberalize, it was forced. He was forced by his constituency, which is Jamaican society. And they were like, we're not doing this. Y'all really need to do something about this because we're tired, right? And they were forced. Their hands were forced, right? And Cameron Wallace lost the privileges that they had. And Digicel saw it and Digicel was like, we're well, coming. And there they came with Superman cape on to rescue us from the evil that was Cameron Wallace. That's how Digicel was able to come in Jamaica, because this is where they came first, to come in Jamaica, plant a seed, and literally started profiting almost immediately. They made a killing. Digicel made a killing in Jamaica. They clean sweep. When I tell you that they never have enough and Yeah? All right, then. So <laughs> I just wanted to share that with you. So it says, since commencing operations in 2001, Digicel has achieved extraordinary success in Jamaica. And by the end of 2004, it had sold nearly 1.5 million cell phones in a country of only 2.6 million. So more than half the country was Digicel in a very short period of time. Right, Cable and Wireless lost the majority <laughs> of its customer base, uh, uh, capitalizing on many Jamaicans' visceral dislike of Cable and Wireless. Did you sell? And this is this is strategy. And let me tell you something. Say what you guys want to say about Did you sell now, but their marketing strategy is second to none. Okay, their marketing strategy is always here. All right, and it and they set that precedent from when they just came in. So this is what they says. It says, Digicel created an impressive marketing campaign led by the highly experienced Jamaican. So they 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 hired a Jamaican to create a strategy because what that person would know what the historical context was they would have understood the, the historical dislike for this company. They knew that Jamaicans, you couldn't tell them, no, we just never liked Kayla Wireless, that there was nothing 
they could have done. And so Harris Smith successfully used many populist images such as Rasta or Roots. Why you guys remember early Digicel was red, green, and black. Remember with some yellow in it. Remember the colors earlier, right? And prominent sponsorship of sports and entertainment. There's two things that Jamaican people will go bat over. Sports and entertainment. And they knew this, right? And what did they start doing? They'll sponsor every team. You can run from your city, yes, so they will sponsor you, right? And of course, the rising star television series, which was a groundbreaking series in Jamaica at the time, because God knows we're also tired of TVJ, right? And so now this was something to watch, right? Uh, and, and, and of course, everybody knew American Idol or what was it? There are so many of these shows at the time and we were wrapped. Like every, every, every time it came out without fail, Jamaicans would be like, and we are root for who on American Idols, we are wrapped. And, and let me tell you something, this is exceptional marketing. And it could have only been done by a Jamaican because they understood the context. They understood their time, if you will, right? And so this is why even today, Digicel does not have as bad a reputation as Cable and Wallace and Flo still have. And I, and I really do think Flo is still suffering from historically bad reputation of Cable and Wallace. Digicel don't get as bad a rap. I know them have Shelly and Fraser, them have Usain Bolt. They have, they have brand ambassadors that people actually like. And there's that association now with, again, Digicel is, has always sponsored sports and entertainment, and they're still doing it, right? So there you are. Let me, let me go to the comments because I see y'all. <laughs> commenting up a storm. Okay, uh, he says, yeah, he worked for Kibler Wallace before. That makes it even better. Oh my God. Rising stars. Um, oh my God, people just are weird pandem to liberalize that sector and JPS outer business. Yes, remember free nights? You guys remember the digital free nights? Yes. Digicel came in with all the goodies and the magic, and they were like, fairy dust, fairy dust, and we went crazy. <laughs> yeah, Nokia, Nokia caused their own demise. Nokia caused their own demise. Oh, he was antipathy. It is always good to, 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 to have antipathy in the chat. Um, of Digital Foundation, yeah. No, you have the Flow Foundation, but too late, too late, Flow. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, man. Digital Jamaica Premier League, Digital Rising Star. Yeah, man, yeah, man. Digital came in with all the goodies. And we were like, yeah, for a long time. And really, declining sentiment about Digital is not as much as with flow. It's declining, but it's not as bad as flow. And really, you really only start to see, it was about the last two, three years that people really started to come out strong against Digicel because we were willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. For a very long time, we gave Digicel the benefit of the doubt. And when flow and Digicel get in a cast cast, whose side we used to take? Tell the truth. Whose side we used to take? Did you sell? We used to take did you sell side? I used to cuss from our tuna bad mind, our tuna terrible. And then when remember when they announced that you could switch over your chip from pro to did you sell, and then it never had a work because did you sell system wasn't working, and then people thought it was because pro never had switch over. Oh my god. <laughs> right? Yeah, man. We used to take we take did you sell side. Yeah, man. 
and and digital capital lies and, and, and i'll give you an example of digital capitalizing you guys you guys how many hands up let me go back to the chat hands up how many of you saw the versus episode with beanie man and bounty killer how many of you saw that let me tell you something you see that night after the versus ended listen twitter was the place to be because digital twitter went off because remember digital sponsored that versus battle and not one time did it stick not one time did it buffer not one time and the people and digital came out and said well i guess you know who's the faster network now and it and digital started reposting the slow flow <laughs> the slow the, like the one i showed you on their twitter and let me tell you people were praising them like oh, who run this who run this twitter they need a raise they need a digital one the night forget being man and bounty killer digital won that night and it was a bloodbath for flow over on it even got picked up in the papers. It was a bloodbath. So it was, you know what I mean? <laughs> because Digicel came in with the quick comments and it, everything they said that night was memeable and they turned into memes. I know you can't think of versus battle without thinking of the Digicel and how Digicel literally trolled the daylight out of flow that night, right? It was, uh, beautiful to watch <laughs> beautiful to watch all right guys let's continue so let's talk about so talk about customer um experience and reputation let's talk now about customer per experience perception and loyalty i would say in some instances perceptions around a brand can be so strong that that it makes that okay so strong that it makes that almost brand okay that is i can't write clearly okay so what i'm trying to say is that the perception of a brand can be so strong that it makes that brand almost impervious to negativity right so much so that no matter what that brand does in the market brand loyalty remain high before we reveal who the brand is who can tell me who men are women Somebody say, KFC. Errol is a KFC. All right, who can guess which brand I'm going to talk about next? Grace. All right, somebody say, Grace, KFC. Which brand you know in Jamaica where no matter what, what no matter when and do, Jamaican people is going to patronize that brand that no matter what they do. Cash back. JPS. Well, JPS, we don't have a choice with JPS, you know, Dennis. We don't have a choice. Right? The rat didn't deter people from KFC. <laughs> JPS. Tasty. Mm. Well, I mean, tasty, tasty enjoys a good reputation and always has. The, 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 the war between tasty and juicy has been beneficial for both brands. Bridget. Mm. I know people that. Tasty can go. All right, Kelly, you have some personal issue with Tasty. All right, guys. 208 for your cheese party, Grace for generation. All right, guys. Which brand am I talking about? Survey says, wait, <clears throat> I want to show you that. Wait, it's KFC, but we won't go back. <laughs> Listen to this, guys. Guys, the hilarious things I find online when I'm doing research. Here is one. As of December 17th, First of all, guys, this was a change.org petition. Change.org. And if you guys know what change.org is, it's an online platform that allows you to build campaigns around things that you want to, around social causes. Let's put it that way. A US student decided that they were going to create a change.org petition. Hear why. <clears throat> As of December 17, 2019, KFC Jamaica has increased their prices numerous times this year. Now, guys, this was three years ago. As we are 
acknowledge rising prices of food and other products around the world during these difficult economic times, it must also be acknowledged that KFC Jamaica is the or one of the most profitable companies within Jamaica. Millions of customers pass through their doors just to get a whiff of the succulent, expensive chicken mixed over with their secret herbs and spices. <laughs> Jamaica people are the best, I tell you. Um, KFC is hurting our pockets and moreover us mentally as we suffer through withdrawal, unable to afford their food. A price increase put upon us is unjustified. KFC director recently put out over, put over $2 billion towards expansion of the restaurants across the island. In 2015, KFC Jamaica collected the award of highest transaction within the Caribbean and Latin American region from their parent company, Young. <laughs> it goes on. As a student of the University of the West Indies, KFC has been both boon and savior to me. It is arguably the most popular place on campus. That is true, all right? Um, boasting more attendance than most lectures. <laughs> Yet by increasing prices, it feels more of a burden rather than a decision to buy food, which is usually the only available decent meal to be bought at late hours of night to midnight. As they feast, we consumers take the brunt of it with another unjustified increase. I hereby ask the owners and directors of KMG Jamaica to think about the people who have generously supported them for years and roll back on their prices. This petition had over 3,000 people signed it. KFC did not roll back on their prices, but KFC kept doing this. Jackson, KFC is here. Portland, KFC is here. St. Thomas, KFC is here. KFC has a stranglehold on Jamaica. But let's look at why. Let's look at why KFC has a stronghold. I have a theory. And I want you guys to work with me here, you know? I have a theory, hear me out, hear me out. Trust, that's my first theory. Customer trust is not only vital in an environment where customer expectations are increasing daily and competition is fierce, but also a brand differentiator that could make or break a business. Guys, even with the rat incident, people were, were more willing to believe KFC than to believe, say, people didn't actually say, all right, do you really trust your lying ass? Or do you trust this chicken? They trusted the chicken. It's a trust issue. Apart from scandals around price hikes, and every now and again, a rat, KFC enjoys a really good reputation in Jamaica. What scandal have you really heard about KFC? People usually are complaining about the long line, the traffic, the things that are go, and they're complaining about these things while they're in the long line in the traffic with the same they are going pay the price when they go. Right? Right? <laughs> And I think a big part of it is, is, is trust. And, and I have another theory as to why we trust KFC. It is sentimental. And let me tell you what I mean by sentimental. And sentimentalism is a very big marketing strategy. Think about brand that we call legacy brand. And, and why legacy brands are still around, still exist and still making a killing in the market. It's the fact that these brands existed at a particular time and there's nostalgia around the brand. I remember when I was younger, KFC was something you only had on birthdays or some other special occasion. It wasn't something my parents could have afforded every weekend. My little sister eats KFC every weekend. Is that a me buying her KFC? Our father buying her KFC? Our auntie buying her KFC? She won't eat KFC every weekend. That was never my experience growing up. KFC was a special occasion kind of thing, and this was it. 
birthday, we're going to go Casey and then we're going to go Baskin Robbins. And if you live in Portmore, you remember that the Baskin Robbins was right across the road from KFC. So it was KFC, Baskin Robbins, home. Don't expect that again until next year. Right? And so the history of KFC was as a luxury item that you could have, that your parents could have only afforded on those special occasions. And, he, and so in Jamaica, KFC became a luxury brand. It became a, a brand for privileged people, a brand of privilege. If you did not have privilege, you could not enjoy KFC. Yeah? And, as, and I think that nostalgia, that thing got implanted in our brains. And to this day, we still see KFC as being a privileged brand. Meaning the fact that you can now go to KFC on a weekend and buy KFC, you've made it. You're stepping up in a life. Yeah, you've arrived. It's just KFC. KFC don't have the same kind of reputation in other markets, certainly not in the market where it originated from in the States. KFC is just another fast food brand because they've had so many fast food brands. Fast food was nothing for them. For us, it was a long story. And so that's where that trust factor came in because of the nostalgia of it, because of your own, what? Experience with the brand. And that, that was the basis upon which your perception was formed. KFC equals good because I got it on good days, on my birthdays, on special events. So KFC equals good experiences. Yeah? And KFC knows this. If you look at how KFC advertises in Jamaica, especially, it's always about an experience. It's always about an occasion. It's always about an event. And no matter what the event is, if Jamaicans can have KFC, they won't have KFC. Think about it. That's just my working theory as to why we're so obsessed with KFC. Yeah? Even the small man, once he make a little money and he can go in a KFC and in lots of money and get some chicken, it's a good day. He has accomplished something. That's, that's my theory. Let's look at, let's look at it again. <clears throat> the brand trust acts as an insurance policy against future issues. That brand trust acts as an insurance policy against future issues is not a new concept. Most organizations know knows that trust bestowed by the consumer cannot only make or break a business, it cannot also ensure you survive a problem in the future. KFC has been surviving and thriving because they know no matter what happened, Jamaicans are going to buy KFC. We're going to sit in that line and complain about KFC while we're buying KFC. We're going to complain about the bad customer service because it's customer service. We're going to complain about the chicken not being consistent. We're going to complain about all of that. But try belief say, try know so when your cousin come from foreign and come on Jamaica, them are going to make sure that when they leave and go to the airport, them are buy them wings and carry on. KFC not taste like KFC. Nowhere else. Jamaican KFC not taste like regular KFC. That's another thing, too. That's another thing. Is it true? Is it true that Jamaican KFC is the best tasting KFC, or is it a perception we have formulated because? We equate this brand with being a privileged slash luxury brand because of our experiences with the brand. I personally think KFC, Jamaica KFC is the best KFC I have had, but I am biased because of my experience with the brand. But right, let me let me go to the comments and see what you guys think. If you guys agree with me. Someone says, thank God for Chef Agent. Chef Agent, come in and tell us. And you know, it's funny. I'm going to do a shameless plug, guys. I had a podcast interview with Chef Agent for the Digital Jamaica podcast. And he gave me the history. Did you know that he was, a, that's where he started out his cooking journey at a KFC? Did y'all know that? Yes. <laughs> and of course, no, and then this is another thing. And, that, and this is where the trust comes in, guys. And even if it is not deserved, where can I hear the podcast? Anywhere podcast is played. We're everywhere, right? 
So what are you guys saying? Uh, it is not like it is true. America care city is bad. No perception of truth. Who remember crazy Tuesdays? It's a, it's a, yes, Danisha is psychology. That's what I'm trying to say. KFC is common food now, but common for whom? Common for whom? And why is it common now? Everybody can now afford KFC, or we assume that everybody can now afford KFC, but try no say, for some people, they save to go KFC and buy their KFC. So it's common for you, but not for everybody else. And there's a reason why KFC is always full. And my theory is that it's a, it's a sentimental, it's a nostalgic thing because of our early experiences with this brand. That's just, I, I think so. Guys, remember one time when KFC used to sell rice and peas? Oh, okay, when they used to sell rice with peas? Remember that? Yes. Um, Shauna K, you saying it's common food. No, I'm not saying it's not common food. I'm saying the reason why Jamaicans love KFC, my theory is that it's nostalgic. That's my theory. Never said it wasn't common. I said it's nostalgic. And be careful. And this is another thing too, when I go into your assignment number two, it's something that you do, and I'm glad Shauna K actually brought it up now. Because Shana K, what is common to you is not generally common. It's not generally common. So because it's common to you, doesn't mean that's, uh, that's the case right across the board. As I said, people save to go KFC. Save to go KFC. Still, yes, let, yes, my daughter, even though people, the, econ the economic, econ economic situations has improved, Drastically, see well, drastically, okay. It has improved since then. Still, people save to go to KFC. Yeah, all right. Uh, I don't ask for some reason. Famous Bowl, I don't, don't ask me why, but Famous Bowl took off in Jamaica, in mind. took off in Jamaica, and I, I personally don't like it. But Famous Bowl, oh my god. Jamaica people that sell elephant, they are famous for. Okay. And we're going to continue on the KFC trend. So let's talk about social proofing. <laughs> social proof is a psychological phenomenon where people assume the actions of others in an attempt to reflect correct behavior for a given situation. And what do I mean? It's the notion that since others are doing it, I should be doing it too. KFC needs social proofing. Think about whether or not a brand that enjoys trust and a brand that enjoys generational trust needs social proofing. Because all the proof you need that KFC is, <laughs> that Jamaicans love KFC, is every time you pass a KFC, there's traffic. You know when a KFC is in the area, if there's traffic. And you see things like this. What is it about KFC that Jamaican people would stand in line for it? And it's not even free. Stand in the hot sun in a panorama. Wow, I would never. He would never, but they did. They did. This is social proofing, you know, guys. This in and of itself is its own form of social proofing. You will never pass a KFC and it's empty. I don't care what time of the day it is, you will never pass an empty KFC. That does not exist. That's not an experience I have ever had. I don't know what. Oh, oh yeah, it's a thing. I could find it later. Let's look at the comments from Gordon Swayze's tweet, right? Uh, somebody said, restaurants of Jamaica will never go to business. People just really love KFC in a very special way. Maybe it's a Jamaican equivalent of a money laundering process. Any cash incentive business can work. 16 herbs and spices. I oftentimes ask myself this very question. They say it's the KFC Ian. Some of us are resistant, but many are not. So caffeine, some something KFC puts that in the food. Salt and fat are highly predictive. There's crack in it. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Uh, same thing I wonder, even at 7 p.m., people wait in hopes to buy Kentucky chicken. Colonel must tie with two pot. 
various reasons. I don't eat meat, but from time to time, family and friends ask for it. And you may see me in the line because you have to purchase a day before on the day of traveling. You see, you have people who come on Jamaica will not be eating up KFC. Somebody said, this is really one of the greatest mysteries in the world. Rain or shine, pandemic or not, it's brand loyalty on steroids. Brand loyalty on steroids. KFC will never, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you an example of a conversation uh, I, I was, I witnessed. I was at the company's office recently um, doing something and two security guards and the lady who does the cleanup, they were having a conversation and one security guard said, oh, and what are you having for lunch today? And the guy said, I'm just gonna go to KFC and get some wings. And the cleaning lady said, you just know, can't see change in price about nine times this year already. We can't, we can't afford KFC, we can't afford KFC. And the security guard says, going to get me. said, I can't afford it either, but we rather go KFC than go to food shop, man. Best believe that him and the lady will clean, go get them KFC. Okay. Okay, all right? So, also referred to as herd mentality, social proof is a phenomenon where decision making becomes credible and validated through the behavior of others. It's the reason we ask for second opinion, assume night clothes with long lines must be good, and the driving force behind displaying product reviews and customer testimonials. The Matalika was telling you about social proofing and how that can help you with sales. KFC don't have a sales problem because it's constant customer proofing. You cannot pass, you will never pass an empty KFC. Never. KFC opening drugs hall and they are already complaining about traffic. On the very first day, let me show you. On the very first day that KFC opened in Jackson, oh, I didn't put it, I didn't put it in. On the very first day KFC opened in Jackson, it was a two hour traffic jam. And people were tweeting, complaining about the traffic jam while they were in the line. So let's talk about online social proofing. Social proofing your brand online is important because not only does it make a brand look good to potential customers, but it is also an opportunity for a brand to, as best as possible, control the narrative. It's about what? Perception. So now, Amazon is famous <laughs> for their customer reviews. One of the things Amazon prides itself on is being very customer-centric. They have set certain standards. And the standards that they have set for themselves has built up a certain layer of protection for Amazon. Amazon is not the best company in the world. It, you can look at any economic report, the way them, the, the fact that their employees are always striking, them high employee turnover. By no measure is Amazon a great company to work for. But their customers don't seem to mind that Amazon has is plagued with these problems. And as much as people complain about Jeff Bezos and his practices as a multi-billionaire and blah, 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 people are not buying Jeff Bezos, right? And outside of the US, none of us care about the whole issue with Jeff Bezos and their anxiety. We just know we want that um, thing on there where you can put your garlic in and then you, you press the button and you check up the garlic. We just want that. That's how you eat it, you know. But, because Amazon is so customer centric, that also builds up trust because you can rest assured if there's an issue that you're having on Amazon, Amazon is going to deal with it and deal with it quick or fast. They have a very high um, response rate, right? <clears throat> and so from that, people leave reviews. And Amazon reviews are memeable. They get turned into memes all the time because they're hilarious. Some of them can be hilarious in terms of how bad the review is or how great the review is. Look like this one. <clears throat> this eyeliner went around like your man does. <laughs> I bought this eyeliner and the first day I wore it, I found out my boyfriend of five years was, che was cheating on me and I cried and cried and cried. I went to the bathroom to make sure that my makeup streaks were wiped off my face. 
but it was still completely perfect. Through all the crying, it stayed in place. So thank you for making an island and that's more trustworthy than a man. <laughs> right? And you'll find hilarious comments like this and reviews like this. Now, this is something that would make you want to buy the island. I mean, you feel sorry for the person, but it's hilarious, it's funny, and it makes you just want to buy it. Some people just buy the thing because the reviews are so hilarious or so fun, right? But people trust Amazon reviews. And I, for one, I don't know about you, but before I buy some off Amazon, I'm looking at the reviews. And if there's more than two or three bad reviews, I ain't buying it. So uh, perception, perception, and you know, um, trying to control that narrative. But then how I, as a shopper, buy is, I have to look at how other people are using it, does this thing actually look like what they say it look like in the pictures? Because the picture them can look nice and pretty when you get it, look not like the picture them, right? Does it work the way they say it's gonna work? What I look at those things and I first place I go is the Amazon reviews, right? But Amazon also has a thing that says Amazon's choice. People trust that too. Not sure why, because sometimes I buy things that are Amazon choice and I end up not liking them, but Eight times out of 10, they end up being with pretty good stuff. So once it has the Amazon's choice on it, that's a certain layer of comfort or protection for me because one, it means that Amazon has approved this product based on their own quality standards. And it's something that I more than likely am gonna enjoy in terms of it being what it says it is, right? Although that can be, people can pay for that too. But, mm -hmm. All right, let's talk, let's look at types of online social proof, right? Clients and affiliations, testimony. So clients and affiliations is basically what you see here. Now this is BrainStation. They do digital training and on their website, you're gonna find that they've trained Apple, Shopify, Netflix, Spotify, Google, Amazon. They've trained for these companies. They've trained their employees, right? And so that's what I mean by clients and affiliations. If you go on a website offering a product or service and you see so this brand name person or this brand name business has used this service and give them high ratings, that goes along with helping you make a decision about that company. Of course, we all know testimonials and reviews, awards and accolades. Has this company won an award in some industry category? That should mean that they're being recognized in their industry because they're recognizing in an industry that must be cool, right? Uh, case studies, they use case studies. So, oh, this customer had this problem. This is how we dealt with this problem. Now this customer loves us, yay. Or this customer used our product and look at the great results that they're having. Case study. User-generated content. So now with the advent of influencer marketing and social influencing, I should say in general, now anybody can grab a product, review the product and that review in and of itself, which is generated by a third party, whether it's paid or unpaid, becomes a form of social proof. Um, and that's why, you know, again, when we're going to assignment too, we're gonna to talk about incentivizing your audience to engage because Look at a brand like Target. Target has a branded hashtag, right? And if you use the branded hashtag, you stand a chance of being your, your post reposted to Target's um, platform that has millions of views, all right? And so that's them incentivizing you to create content about their brand, of course, positive, and they will share it on their platform so you can get some traction on your platform as well. And of course, their customer base. If you're a Gucci and you can say your customer base is celebrities, that goes a long way. A small brand, ah, I'll give it a perfect example. Michelle Obama made it a point um, to wear young, open coming designers of color. She made it a point, right? And now they had, they could brag that the first lady or the former first lady wore my, my design. And that got them a lot of business. A lot of them um, got recon, recon, recognition, recon, recognized, recognized. A lot of them got recognized because Michelle Obama wore um, their clothes, right? 
So being able to boast a, you know, a certain type of customer base is also a type of social proofing. Of course, followers and engagement is a type of social proofing. If you're going to page and not going to and nobody not comment and them not have a lot of followers, are you going to stay there? And I and I and I and I thought it interesting because I I've now come to realize how I actually use um, platforms, especially TikTok. If I come across a TikTok, for some reason, the first thing I look at is how many likes that thing has and how many comments it has before I even like a comment, whether I like it or not. And it's just conditioning. It's just how I use the, that particular platform, right? No, it's very different than how I use Instagram. With Instagram, I'm looking at the content itself and not necessarily how, on, how many likes and comments has. Don't ask me why I have made, why I use these platforms so differently. I just don't. It's something I noticed about myself recently. But guys, let's look at this platform and I want you guys to tell me how many types of social proofing you notice on this platform, right? So, let me go to the chat. You guys tell you guys can tell me how many social proving. Um, let's see how much social proofing uh, you guys see on here. So, so we'll see the one with the clients and affiliates. So as I scroll down, jump in the chat, what other type of social proofing you guys see? Okay. You guys, you guys notice any other type of social proofing? What is it? Uh, okay, we're not seeing testimonials yet. Customer base accolades. That's right, Amisha. Uh, uh, accolades and brand affiliation, which is the same as customer base. Yes. So here they're showing you that they have one or how their rating is on these platforms. Best coding, bootcamp, switch up, Google. So these are accolades that they have won. And if you go down here, these are their hiring partners. So this is again, brand affiliation, client affiliation partners and customer base because um, these are also that you could look at them as their customers. And of course, it's so who is who of who. Now, part of what this company does is when they train you, they put you in their referral program, which is a hiring program. And so, and so what they're trying to say is once you have trained with us, you stand a chance of being hired by one of these companies because they trust our training. That's what this is saying, right, guys? All right, let's scroll on further. What do you guys see here? What kind of what kind of um social proofing is this? One hundred thousand plus professional trains in professionals trained in over one hundred countries. What kind of social proofing is this, guys? Customer base, exactly. This is customer base. Basically, what they're saying is look how many people have we trained and look how far our product or service has reached over 100 companies, or 100 plus countries. That's a lot. There's like what, 280 official countries in the world? 100 plus countries is a lot. And this is a small brand, right? Let's scroll. Student success stories. What kind of social proofing is this, guys? And I think they have a couple. What kind of so? Okay, let's see what you guys saying. Word of mouth, yes. Testimonials, reviews, yes. Client base. Uh, but guys, this can also be a case study. This can also be a case study as well, right? I think that's what Michaela was trying to say. Mikhail, I think that's what you were trying to say, right? It's testimony, yes, but it's also can also be used as a case study. You can also use a case study. And this person is now a software engineer at Microsoft, which is another affiliation, right? So guys, look at this now. Learn from guest experts throughout the program. What kind of social proofing is this?
Let's see if you guys are thinking. So they're saying that you can, Brain Station students get access to exclusive guest lectures and panel discussions led by some of the world's leading subject matter experts and industry professionals. What are they saying? No, not user just affiliations. It's affiliations. Um, because they're saying these persons are the best in the world and they're wearing them from Wix, Adidas, Facebook. So it's another form of brand affiliation, guys. And it's no affiliation with experts. Yes, experts, but not just experts, but experts from certain brands that are already trusted or already well known in the space. So yes, client and affiliation. Yes. All right, guys. And see, they show some more down there. So on this one website alone, they had about five or six different types of social proofing. And if you didn't know what social proofing was, you wouldn't have realized that that's what they were actually doing. Right, guys? So um, it's, it's a subtle thing. It's not necessarily overt unless you're in the marketing space and you say, okay, so that's exactly what they're doing. Right, so social proofing. When I see you guys in the assignment number two, you guys are things like, oh, we're gonna um, publish um, testimonials. That's just one way of social proofing. It doesn't have to be that overt. And we're gonna look at women's marketing code because women's marketing code does a lot of social proofing on her thing, but she does it in a very different way. What she does is she uses her stories. So when somebody messages and go, hey, I just did your course and now I implemented the strategy that you told me and now I've moved from 200K to 300K business, that's social proofing. But how she put that out on the platform is very different because it's usually a conversation and she's sharing the conversation and or she's telling them congratulations and she's supporting and cheering them on. But what she's really doing is flexing. She's flexing and she flexes hard on our platform, right? Thank you, Anika. Very important point Anika made. Anika says social profit should look like should look seamless and not like an ad. Fair enough. I'll take that point. Although, you know, you can put testimonials and stuff, but people have come to not trust them now. People have come to not trust these testimonials because people are thinking, are these real people? Are these real, real people? Isn't this, this could be a stock photo on the internet, you know? So yeah, the more seamless you can make it, I think is the better the response is gonna be. So now guys, let's look at responding to negative feedback. While a bad or negative review can spell disaster for brand reputation, it can also be an opportunity to demonstrate brand personality and character, which can endear your brand to existing and potential customers. Now, guys, before, there's something I forgot to mention earlier when we were talking about you know, perception and reputation. Did you guys know that multiple studies have shown that it is easier and cheaper to retain customers than to acquire new customers? Think about the amount of marketing that you have to put in to acquire new customers. However, if you have a good strategy in place and you have a solid email strategy specifically, a solid social media customer um, service apparatus in place, you can retain your customers way easier than trying to get more customers. So I, I forgot to say that earlier, but it's something I thought that, you know, it's impactful. You guys really need to bear that in mind. So with good customer service and a solid strategy, you can retain your customers and it will be cheap. And then you spend less money, I should say, trying to recruit new customers, especially if your reputation is not that great. It's gonna cost you even more money, right? So customer retention is cheaper that acquisition, bear that in mind. So, and especially now when we talk about how you respond to negative feedback, because this could be, um, this could decide whether or not that customer stays with you or that customer goes, you'll yeah, never get another penny on my money, right? So let's look at it. Do's and don'ts when responding to negative feedback. And you guys are wondering, why do I have flow here? Because I tell you, in many ways, the perception about flow 
doesn't necessarily match the reality of flow. Now, I happen to think that on Twitter, not on Instagram, on Twitter, Flow has a decent customer service um, system on Twitter. So now, if you look at the times, this is this is a, this is a conversation between me and Flow. There's a, there was an issue on my phone, and I messaged them, and within an hour and some, call it two hours. Within two hours, they responded. I gave them my information, and this conversation went back and forth. Now, granted, they didn't help me. They asked me for the five million things, I never helped. But they responded. So I guess, <laughs> so in this way, they responded, but the response was not helpful. And that's, 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 that's another thing too. So just being quick to respond is not enough. The response has to be helpful, but we'll get into that. So do respond in a timely manner. Do address the customer by name. They didn't do that here, but okay. Do apologize. What did they say? We apologize for the issue being experienced. Do sympathize with the customer. They went on to say with your mobile and delay and, and the delay to respond. So they are, they're also apologizing for their delayed response. Form of sympathy. Um, a short action to address situation. Please share your number. They said they will be happy to help. And they proceeded to start giving me some things that I could do, right? Timely follow through. They followed up with me right through, even though what they were asking to do did not work. They followed up with me right through. Now, I am not sure at this point if the problem was actually flow or if it was a phone problem. I'm leaning to flow because when I tried to dial out, nothing was happening. Don't know if it's a phone or a phone problem, but nothing they told me to do work. But they responded, they apologized, and they tried to help. All right. And the last one, make it right. Try as best as possible to make it right. And what do I mean? You can offer the customer something. Uh, if it's a situation where, uh, I want to go back. If it's a situation where you can say, okay, if it's a restaurant, say it's a restaurant and they get the food from you and the food wasn't what they expected or not the quality they expected or something, you guys can say, we're so sorry. We apologize for, you know, your bad experience with the food. We know you guys were hungry and you just wanted to have a good meal and it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to. Uh, we are going, we're looking, uh, we're looking into the situation and we're going to find whatever the issue was or where it went wrong and we're going to fix it. And then you follow up with them and say, hey guys, this is the situation. This is what happened again. We apologize, but the next time you come in store, use this code or here is a free voucher or something that you can use the next time you come in store or even right now, if you want to, we can replace your meal free of charge and we will deliver it to you for free. Making it right, right? So you see that I went through all of that just now. Right, so that's kind of how uh, you respond. Here's what not to do to negative feedback, JPS. Okay, so let me go back. Somebody says, since it's clear that paying customers are carrying the burden of the fees, why not turn the focus on those who are not paying? Okay, yes, you have been trying for years and it's hard. Incentivize those who reveal, reveal, reveal I think that means reveal, electricity. You did that? JF, that JPS proceeded to go on this long rant about battling electricity theft and communities are of illegal customers. And what do you want us to do? Do you want us to go in and remove their connection and destabilize homes? No, this is where JPS gave themselves away. Because in a lot of these instances, and I can tell you, I had a short pass in the political space when I was working for a member of parliament. And in that member of parliament's constituency, there were a lot of illegal settlements. 
or informal settlements. They were not illegal, they were, let's call them informal settlements. And in an effort to formalize these settlements, you had persons who wrote to JPS to say that, listen, this is where we live. There's a certain amount of persons in this area now. The government was making moves to formally give these people titles and stuff, and JPS absolutely refused to put up poles in the neighborhood and put in electricity in the, in, in the place. They refused. Several times they refused. So JPS knows, they know that a, a lot of the reasons why persons need electricity is because either bad connection, old power lines, that was another issue. I was also working in the personal injuries department in our law firm. And you'd be surprised how many complaints we get about JPS poles just falling down on people, falling down on people's houses, all sorts of stuff with JPS. They take out the pole and they leave big holes in the wall, in the sidewalk, and people dropping out the holes. Then the power line come down and fry people things. It's ridiculous. JPS has a crumbling infrastructure, and that infrastructure also goes towards why our electricity bill is the highest in this side of the hemisphere. But they would rather tell you that the issues are that, that. that's the problem. And when this person says, okay, why not incentivize the people then then? And this is what they, the fallback is always, so do you want us to destabilize or which one is it, JPS? Which, which is it? Which is it? Is it destabilizing homes or is it proper connection? Because it seems to me like you're trying to make a trade-off and you decide that it is easier to just charge everybody else. Hmm? Okay. So that's that's JPS. And they went on. Um, and so from this, we can learn a lot about how not to respond. Ignore feedback. For a long time, JPS was not responding to anybody. They were just acting like this doesn't exist. And then when they do respond, they're very confrontational. You guys saw it. it this actually made the newspaper because it became a riot on Twitter between people and JPS. I know, I know for a fact. So whosoever was running this JPS account got fired because this was just not it not address the issue notice they did not address what the person said right and the, uh, jps has never really addressed or really came to us and explained to us how they calculated this whole thing and what they're doing about the theft and what they're not doing and what has worked or what you, you really don't hear all them tell you say is that is theft and you know i'm beginning to think is that really the problem because then this has been a perennial problem how come you guys haven't fixed it Mm, I'm just saying they discredit the customer. Um, and so let's look at the tweet. They say a lot of methods have been employed to battle. They don't they notice they didn't tell you what the methods were. So somebody says JPS must do exactly that or get the get the government to underwrite the cost for legally connecting them as social electricity project. Turning up blind eye theft is a, is a dangerous presidential society where we want to stop with corruption and crime. And um, person saying, I, if I don't pay my bill, that is exactly what you do to me. My life matters. Uh, so you, you guys can see the comment. Um, somebody says, is it ethical or even legal? And of course, people are asking the OUR. And then what people say, the OUR doesn't work for us. They, they don't care. Um, Somebody say yes, because if me and on team like gonna come take it off and lock me up. So it, it, the backlash was <laughs> somebody say, is that the question? Are you really answering the question? Because we didn't we didn't answer the question. And then people went on to talk about how bad the response was and the fact that you know this was a poor response from JPS, blah blah blah. What they did was defend, not sympathize. We are already struggling. Everybody knows that Jamaicans are struggling. And we have the highest electricity rate in the region, in this side of the world, right? JPS knows this. We know this. And there seems to be the perception is 
they don't sympathize with us. Instead, they defend the reason why in Christmas break, in a panoramic, they increased the bill. Yes, they went and they defended that. Remove the feedback. So after this whole backlash um, happened, JPS removed several of their tweets and you know that in and of itself became a problem. So do not be a JPS, be a kind of flow, but better. It's, 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 when the bar is so low, guys, when the bar is so low, right? <laughs> Let's talk about social listening and this is the last one. And we're going back to KFC, right? So what is social listening? Social listening is the monitoring of your brand's social media channels for customer feedback and direct mentions of your brand or discussions regarding specific keywords, topics, competitors, or industries which can be analyzed for insights and opportunities to, to act, right? It is also great for discovering exactly what, guys, pay special attention to this. It is also great for discovering exactly what topics and hashtags your audience use most. So you know um, exactly what you need to talk about and which hashtags to use in order to reach as many people as possible while also offering them the type of content they want to see or read, right? Um, so benefits of online social listening. And the reason why I had KFC there is that, again, guys, because of how KFC structured their, their, their messaging around Jamaica. KFC knows that it's a celebration brand and it has always been a celebration brand. KFC is consumed at special occasions, special events, one time and still to this day, even though more people can afford KFC now, KFC is still a part of our celebration. It's still a celebration brand, right? Office party, KFC. Christmas party, KFC. Little picnic party, KFC. And they know. So you'll find that a lot of their marketing is around events and occasions. And that's what their messaging is too. And I want to show you. Let me, let me quickly show you what I'm talking about. I want you guys to look at KFC marketing during the holidays. KFC. All right, guys. So again, all of their marketing is around some kind of um um kind of event or occasion. And and the funny thing is, even with KFC. Even, even, even lunch is an occasion for, for Casey. But let's look at their Christmas marketing, guys. The bucket with the chicken. The holiday season may be almost over, but the vibe never stops with KFC. All of your festive feast today. So of course, they had the festive feast. Um, they talk about, um, you know, as we celebrate the most wonderful and festive time of the year, KFC Jamaica wants to wish about. So this was their Merry Christmas thing, of course. Pushing KC still. There was a family one. Here it is. This family one. Spend time with the ones you love. Uh, with the ones you love, your family and KFC. KFC knows. They know. They know. Okay. You see this hashtag here, sir? No matter what. KC knows that no matter what, we're going back to KFC. <laughs> right? So KFC had a lot of marketing throughout the, 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 the festive season. Say yes to festive feast again, uh, bucket holidays, bucket life, bucket Christmas, bucket season. Look at the hashtags that they were using. And there's a reason why they were promoting buckets during the holidays. Clearly there's a reason why you get more chicken, family feast, all that good stuff. Just the season for a festival feast, this holiday season, enjoy KFC family chill bucket with 12 pieces of delicious chicken, blah, 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 and two liter Pepsi. Of course, again, bucket season, bucket life, family of 12, KFC Christmas, blah, blah, blah. So guys, KFC pays, very, very much pays attention to um, what people are saying about the brand and they act accordingly. KFC does a lot of things, a lot of 
uh, promotions and messaging around lunchtime and lunch. Uh, let's look at this one. The face you make when you know you're a big deal, right? So KC, big deal. Notice where he is in a comfort coach. Look like he's in his home with a big deal. But don't look like that when you actually might. I just, let me not go there. We still are doing big. Not, you'll notice too the messaging and the tone. They very much incorporate Patwa and Jamaican slang in their, in their branding and marketing. That's intentional, guys, right? Um, and notice when Christopher Martin came in the song, when we are big deal, how that became very much a part of KFC's branding. That was also intentional. You also see that KFC incorporates a lot of cultural elements as well. So you'll find, you'll find music in there a lot. You'll find um, sports in there a lot. You'll find family gatherings and get togethers and stuff like that um, in KFC. Um, in KFC's marketing, people hanging out, just KFC wants you to believe that this is a regular, day, regular everyday thing. Um, it can become a part of your everyday regular life. College, work, just chilling at home, it's always KFC because they know no matter what, we go and buy KFC. There's another thing I want you to notice, but we're going to talk about that when we come to the assignment, right? So let's talk about online, benefits of online social listening. And it's our final topic, guys. Track, you can track brand sentiment. And what do we mean by brand sentiment? Brand sentiment is really how people perceive you. You can actually track, like, especially on um, platforms like Twitter. You can track brand sentiment. Um, and that takes into account mentions, hashtags. If people reuse your hashtag, if people mention you in the, the good post or even if they don't, right? You can track the sentiment um, online. You can determine your market position based on social listening. So depending on how often people talk about you or talk about your product or stuff, you can determine how much of the market um, is aware of your brand, how visible you are in the market, and what kind of position you hold in that market. Um, using social listening tools can help you to build loyalty and trust. It can help you attract new customers because if you are listening and you're hearing what they're talking about and you can incorporate that into your messaging once it's, it's aligned and makes sense, then you can attract new customers and in doing it, do it, do it in a subtle way where they don't even realize that you're using what they're saying um, to attract them to your brand. And of course, you can increase customer satisfaction and monitor the competition. Okay, guys? So that was the last, last topic for this cohort, guys. Uh, so let's look at what you guys are saying in the chat. KFC shifted from luxury to everyday. Yeah, they had to. They had to. KFC Japan, never heard of it. Um, Jide. Go back to first social media listening, please. Go back to first social media listening. This one. All right, guys. So any questions you can or comments or so you, you can use the raise hand feature and we can chat for a little bit and then I'm gonna go over to the assignment. What is a panoramic? <laughs> it's just what people call a pandemic. People, you know, trying to make lights. You know, they said Jamaican people take things make joke. Yeah. How you don't mention quartz and singer? <laughs> <laughs> because to be honest, it's not as of it's not as 
it's not as salacious as these other brands, to be quite honest with you, but courts. And you'll notice that a lot of the legacy brands in Jamaica, uh, a lot of them don't have a very good reputation, especially the ones that came in and were the only one and had a monopoly on the space for a very long time. Um, people don't like monopolies, guys, because you don't. it takes away your choices or it limits your choices. And so that's the one reason why people don't like monopoly. So courts for a long time had a monopoly on, you know, these like a, as a furniture place or whatever, and people just don't like them. Oh, no, not to that get cancelled. It was just a joke. Was there a slide for what to do with negative feedback? You missed it, Khalil. You can watch the replay. Is it common for companies to have different people manage each social media account? Probably not different people managing each account, but it's common for them to have an agency managing an account. And what the agency may do is have multiple people manage that account. And so probably different people deal with the different um, social media profiles. That's, that's, that's common. So I see some raised hands. Oh, well, I did see raised hands. Raise hands on. Guys, any questions? Anything you want to say before we move into the assignment? As a social media manager, you have signed up to an agency instead of being independent. Well, you can work for an agency that does digital marketing, which would include social media marketing, but probably not. They'll probably hire you as an accounts manager if you have social media management experience. That's a thing. Whether or not you're going to get paid what you deserve as a whole other thing. Any other question, guys? Scrolling through your comments. KFC Japan, tell us about KFC Japan. Jamila has her hand up. Okay, Jamila, go ahead. Hi, Kadia. Somebody said, tell you about KFC Japan. Well, I lived in Japan for nine years. Okay. And the, everything I read about KFC Japan is very true. It don't, taste, it don't taste good like Jamaica KFC, that's for sure. Except the biscuit is way far superior than our biscuit. But the, the big thing that they're famous for is in December, um, KFC and Christmas go hand in hand in Japanese culture. Oh. They, yeah, because J- Japan is a Buddhist country, so they yeah. don't celebrate Christmas generally. Mm-hmm. But the younger generation, um, they celebrate it as a, ta- a type of like, just as KFC's um, branding is about events and gatherings and get together, it's very much the same in Asia as well. And so in Japan, they have tapped into that market where friends get together and celebrate the young generation get together and celebrate an outing together for christmas day it just so happens that until about maybe two years ago uh when the before the new emperor was re, um in, um came into being or what they call it emperor yes they still have it um so there is eight, it called emperor is it called president no emperor of japan Yes. yes you have emperor and you have, you have emperor and prime minister. They have they have um two different set. just like how in England you have the queen and you have oh, the, okay. the parliament. They have a similar I was, system. I was today years old. <laughs> um so anyway, so their date system is based on the birth date of the emperor. So up until about 2022 or some or recently about recently there was another emperor whose birthday was on december the 23rd so that was a public holiday 
So it falls just before Christmas, right? So for many years now, KFC took advantage of that and ran a whole big ad campaign where they had the buckets thing, the deal on the buckets and whatever. And from then, you have to, it got so popular that you have to actually book in advance, like months in advance. And you think our line is anything? <laughs> in Japan, on that week of Christmas, the lines are ridiculous. People sleep over, they have, um, they have, what do you call it? Those, what do you call those camping bags that you sleep in? Mm-hmm. Sleeping bags, right. People in them sleeping bags on the roadside for days. And this is cold. This is December where snow is falling. And just, just to get up, some buckets of chicken. Just to get a bucket of KFC. I mean, like for us as foreigners, to have KFC on Christmas is kind of the, the, um, a depressing thing. You know, you used to your ham and your, your turkey or whatever culture you come from. You know, you have big cooking for Christmas. But in Japan, to have a bucket of chicken with the uh, mashed potatoes and the corn and everything, that's like a big thing. And they, okay. and they line up for days. It's a, it's a new iPhone. Yeah, uh, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> It's very real. But yeah. All right. Thanks for sharing. All right. Thanks for sharing that. That's insane. Thanks for sharing that, Jamila. Um, wow. I did not know. I did not know that. And I did not know that they still had an emperor. Because I was about, I was about to be like, really, really have an emperor. I did not know that. Oh, somebody says the KFC in South Africa allows you to place your order on a self-serve screen. Wow. Wow. Somebody talk about the dynasty. Guys, y'all hearing what happened with Prince Andrew? Mm. <laughs> ah, you guys are hearing what he got stripped of his uh, of his, his royal highness titles. You guys heard about that? Mix up, man. The chickens are coming home to roost for poor Andrew. Or it's all over here at TikTok. Oh, somebody says Thailand KFC have green curry chicken on their menu. In some way, in some places, KFC have really tried to have local based dishes. They never really take off so well in Jamaica. Yeah, man, them plucking wicked. All right, guys. <laughs> Let's go into uh Guys, this is going to sound controversial. Jamaicans don't do barbecue well. Jamaicans think barbecue is ketchup and sugar. It's not barbecue. Uh. Mm. KC barbecue is the most disgusting thing I've ever eaten in my life. No, KC spicy chicken any day of the week. Hi, Jonathan. You can go ahead. Oh, hi. <clears throat> no, I was just commenting on the whole matter and the barbecue situation. Because, mm-hmm. yes, it, it sucks here in Jamaica in comparison to what my experience was in Canada. It sucks, Swede, and I'll never take it back. I said what I said. <laughs> No, no, no. It, it, it is what it is. Um, I'm a fan of chicken and, and, and I'm a barbecue person, especially with barbecue ribs. But when I've come to um, learn the different cultures, I tend to realize that we, we really are a knockoff in terms of barbecue. I mean, give, we'll give a jerk chicken any day and people yeah, will cry for it. Right? But when I learned how to do barbecue and when I learned that the barbecue, the way they do barbecue in Canada and the United States is different from in Jamaica and how they use their, their spices and all that. I realized that we really don't know how to do barbecue. We don't know barbecue, Jonathan. <laughs> so, and Brian so, Kessler, whatever they want to say, it's a thing. But it's not. It's not. Uh-uh. Spicy chicken. But the spicy chicken thing, I mean, I've, I've tasted KFC in different countries and in comparison to Jamaica. But then when you look at it in comparison to the taste of Jamaica, we can say yes. Yeah. Some people say they don't see the difference, but there is actually a difference in some. If somebody said they don't see the difference, Jonathan, they're lying. 
<laughs> I found out that Jamaican said that today um, from Miami. Um, but the reality is that I can tell you the, the chickens I've tasted in North America, um, they, they taste insipid. But the reality is that what I come to realize is that it's what they use, how they use the spices, and what the tradition of the day is. Yes, and the type of chicken that they use. And the type of chicken that they use. That is so but correct. Because I have never been to the States, but for many years I lived in England. And let me tell you something. I know okay. that expression. <laughs> okay. The nastiest thing. I'm, oh, want to vomit in your mouth. It's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. No. Uh -uh -uh. The worst, the worst tasting KFC. The worst tasting KFC. And I think the reason why it tastes terrible is the chicken. I tried it, Dwayne. I tried it. Oh my God. Oh. Oh. And it, I think it's how we raise our chicken. I, I think it's the chicken. I honestly think that makes a difference. And you guys know it's local chicken we use. So I think the chicken is just superior. That's just my opinion. And technically, some can't be called KFC. <laughs> yeah, some can't be called chicken. <laughs> No, the chicken in the chicken in England was the KFC in England was disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. I think it's I think it's because of what the chicken eat. I don't know anything about chicken wearing, but I just know I think the chicken makes a huge difference. Because even with the herbs and spices, this comes pre-packaged. It's not, I don't know if we, I don't think we're adding anything. I just think the chicken makes a difference. All right then, guys. Shout out to Kiss of Fox. Y'all are scandalous. Oh my days. All right, guys. Let's look into assignment number two. Somebody said I had KFC in Mississippi. It was the bomb. It's like eating soul food and fried down wedges. It can depend on where it is. Um, KFC in areas where have a lot of black people. Just saying. No, I didn't make the announcement yet. Featherless chickens. All right, guys, let's, let's, it's, it's 12 o'clock. I wanted to do this from 11.30, but I want to uh, go over the assignment with you guys. Am I still sharing my screen? No. All right, let me bring up the assignment with you guys. I was going through and I found some common errors among all the assignments. And I thought to myself, let me just do a general thing and go through the assignments with you. First things to note, guys, some first things to note. Let me share the screen. KFC at Windward Road is one of the best in Kingston, hands down. Okay. Personally, personally, I think the KC Crossroads is the best KC in Kingston. Personally. Personally. The one right across from Payless, that one or other. I think the next best case in Kingston is one cross springs. Red is Road, KFC, and me at war. We've been at war for years. Mm -mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Did you know that the KFC beside the Chinese Benevolent Center is the first KFC in Jamaica? The best KFC in Jamaica, the best KFC in Jamaica is the one in Montego Bay. Y'all can at me. I don't know what. All who want the best KFC in a Jamaica are the one in Mobile. The best KFC in a Jamaica are the one in Mobile. By far, hands down, no matter what time you're going to get, the KFC shots. Yeah, man, Mobile, hands down, hands down, hands down. 
the line always long. The line always long. And I will sit in that line, praise Jesus, because I know, amen, that the chicken is going to be good, thank God. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> Mm -mm. I'm okay, you're used to it. Yes, yes, that's okay. Glory to God. Glory to God. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. For guys, I I I I am a KFC kete. I'll admit. I'm a KFC kete. And I've had KFC all over Jamaica. The best KFC I have had is the one in Mumbai. And I cannot go to Mumbai and don't get chicken, go don't get KFC. Not possible. But I'm a look of KFC money tucked in a Brazil. Yes. Remember, my baby. All of a KFC, though. Mm. And you know what? The funny thing about not having a KFC in St. Thomas, people actually don't think KFC, think St. Thomas is developed because there's not a KFC in it. And that's a no. That's another point I wanted to raise with you guys. Thank you so much for saying that. KFC civilizes anywhere it goes. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. People have a people tend to talk about what's it. So I came across a conversation online where two people was cursing out them one another, and one was saying. Well, only not even have KFC which found in a back of wild place. It was saying that people associate development and economic socioeconomic improvements with KFC because KFC now go go there if they now go make money there. KFC have been very good at put at deciding, determining where they need to be and. I don't know one case you're gonna make money. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about it, think about it. And it's because of that experience with KSC. KSC now got over money today. So if your place not developed enough, then go in there. But I could have sworn I saw somewhere where they said that they were putting a KFC in St. Thomas. I could have sworn I saw that in somewhere. People were like, finally, look how much KFC in Portmore. Look how much KFC in Portmore. There's three KFC in Portmore alone. Three in Portmore alone. You have anywhere else where more KFC than Portmore? And every one of them full. And every one of them full. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Everywhere full. And the other ones were supposed to alleviate the terrible traffic where the KFC at the mall. All of them cause traffic. Every single one of them cause traffic. Every single one of them. Portmore can get well. We don't have a hospital yet, so maybe not. All right, guys, let's look at <laughs> let's look at the assignment. KFC, my observation is that people associate KFC with civilizing certain places. And if you don't have a KFC, are you really that civilized now? I am. I am. So yeah, can do another one. Probably not have two in Portmore because. And trust me, they're going to full same way. Um, okay. So, guys, let's look at the assignment. I'm going to collapse the chat for a little bit. Guys, let's focus on the assignment. So, this is... So, let's look at what I... I and I want to open it up twice. I want to have it open in two tabs because I want... We're going to switch back one. Show of hands... How many of you actually read the slides in the uh, in in the um? How many of you actually read the slides in the templates that I give you? Show of hands. 
how many of you actually read the slides in the template that I gave you? Like fully read through the slide, go and look at the documents I tell you to look at. How many people? All right, all right, okay. So if you guys completely go, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with where I found the most issue. First of all, guys, you see when you see things like these, you're not meant to fill them out. These are only samples. I see several groups completely, I mean, fancy it out and fully it out. I was like, but where in the instructions that I asked you guys to do this? I don't, I don't understand. Okay. So the first thing you guys were asked to do, and let me go back to, let me go here. The first task that you guys got was to, apart from a sheet, outline three main brand content pillars and three sample posts. Now, I understand, now that I've gone back and read it, that you guys may have thought I meant one sample post per content pillar. Although the majority of persons got what I meant, which means I wanted three sample posts per pillar. pillar. Some people didn't, and I understand, and I understand that it could have been read the other way as well. But guys, when I say things like outline, explain, define, I'm expecting at least a paragraph. At least a paragraph. So when you do this, and drop something, you're not outlining it, okay? Many of you did, did that. But guys, the reason why I had a problem with this part of your assignment is that I don't think many of you look through this part of this assignment, which is a sample. Because if you had looked through this, you would have seen how I laid it out here. So I gave the content pillar, uh, and I and I what I did was I identified the pillar, which was handmade product. That's a pillar, and then subtopics that I could possibly take out of the pillar. So telling the brand's unique story, involving the audience in the day to day, expressing product value subliminally. Then I went to post ideas, social media platform, media type type of engagement. So when you come here and you only drop one thing there, one thing here, and I see some of you do this. What, what 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 am I to get from this? When you just when you do this, what am I? How is this outlining? So for many, it was a structural issue of you guys actually not do what I asked you to do, which was the outline, and then give sample. And I was say example, I said give a sample post. Now let's see how we could make this better. So if this is if this is like something you have, let's see how we could make better. If there's something special about your customer service, then it can become a content pillar. Because if you guys recall, let's 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 look at developing content pillars. I said your content pillar is usually areas your brand or business has expertise has expertise or interest in and i could have gone to say that makes your brand special because that that could also be a part of your content pillars so now do does your brand have some kind of special expertise in customer service or interest in customer service or is there something unique about your customer service that would form your content pillar because then from that content pillar you can get sub topics if you guys remember the example i showed you with who to who tweet who tweet i don't know right so it was one major topic and then from that topic about blogging 
they had like about 20 other subtopics from that one main topic. So instead of just dropping customer service, if you guys, what, what are some special, some special features about customer service? Uh, what are some special features about customer service that we could put here? So instead, instead of just saying customer service. All right, say for instance, you guys have won an award. We're going to do the social proving, social proving you know, for your online customer service. You guys have been recognized for having top quality customer service. So instead of customer service here, you guys could say something like, you are going to, one of your content pillars is exceptional customer service ranking among our returning customers. Or something like that. Something like that. This way, your sample post could be video testimonial from X customer. Re so you guys will probably have an idea of who the customer is. Say something happened, some shipping thing, and she never gets her package. Re shipping. A re resolution of shipping issue in time for holidays. So, say for instance, this customer wanted a special present for her grandmother for the holidays. You ship it in time, but there were some issues, and you guys went the extra mile to make sure that she got this on time. That's an idea. That's a post idea. You're going to put that here. And of course, it's a video um, testimonial. And of course, it's Instagram feed. This is going to be an Instagram feed, but it could also be Facebook put up, or wherever else you're, you're going to put uh, the content. So you put that here. Now, guys, this is a much better, this is, it's, 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 it makes more sense than what you had before. Because if you just have customer service, and an example, Guys, oh no, go and quiz these people to death. Why is it that every single person told me about an Instagram poll? In order for Instagram polls to work or these types of activities to work, you guys would have already had to establish a relationship with these people. They're not just going to come and give you information like that. There has to be a relationship. They have to feel like you are involving them in some decision-making process, but that comes with trust and what? Their experience of your brand. So as new brands, I'm just going to go on and one big part of the strategy just polls, I'm going to go and poll people today and they're going to stop responding because they don't know you like that, right? So be a little bit more imagined imaginative so this is some so this this guys so let's talk about it so this is a video testimonial from ex customer re resolution of shipping issue in time or funny review you guys can put hilarious because i know how you guys like to tussle a hilarious review from customer x re um or hilarious reaction video, TikTok video from customer X. Because you are social listening, so you know who's posting about your brand and what is this guy's user-generated content, right? And then the other one could be... Uh, a uh, message from customer service manager about recent uh, awards for best customer service in class, whatever. It's an industry award. Or message uh, or reaction from customer service team for winning best customer service at X Industry Awards.
And then you guys put this up like this, gift. So this could be a gift. So you probably capture something and you turn it into a gift. So somebody might have jumped up and do something hilarious or funny or something, and you turn it into a gift and you put that on your platforms and you create a story about it. And of course, this, this would be, it could be Instagram reels because you know you can turn TikTok videos into Instagram reels posts and repurpose for Facebook story because facebook don't have reels facebook story and since most of you decided that your best platform was instagram and facebook even though if you guys should go here so i would have said to you guys i would have said to you guys see platform overview handout where I went through and the most popular social media platforms that I told you guys, the pros, the cons, best type of content. All right, let me show you an example. This one. How many of you guys actually, no guys, this was an error. Facebook is actually still Facebook. It's just that the company is now Meta. And I see a lot of you guys put Meta. I don't know if you put Meta because I put it here, but Facebook is still Facebook. It's just they've changed their corporate name to Meta. But guys, look at this. I give you active monthly users. I give you local active monthly users. Best content format, best content type, best features, best for pros and cons. How many of you actually use this as your reference point for platforms? Not a lot of you did. Because a lot of you, your companies are B2B customers and you're telling them about Facebook and Instagram. And if you notice, I said here so, Business to business, B2B, LinkedIn, Twitter, or business to consumer, Facebook, Instagram, brand to fans, YouTube, blogs, TikTok, think influencers, example, example, Jackie. I. I don't think a lot of you actually read the slides, or if you're reading them, you're just going through them and not actually taking into account what they're saying because all of them, every single one without fail says when it gets to here so. Instagram and Facebook. We don't fear Instagram and Facebook. All right, so guys, this is an example of how you of, of what I wanted to see, right? So um, this is how you guys could have done it. And you guys can see that it is so because remember, I can only mark what I see. And if you guys are explaining things to me or giving me a little explanation or even a three lines, or it makes more sense than if you guys just have customer service because you're going to get feedback like customer service, what? What are you trying to say? So when you see me give you feedback like that is because I don't have enough information to determine what you're trying to tell me. All right, guys, so this is one example. Let's go to this one. For the love of Jesus and all of these four. Identify the two main social media platforms for okay. Tell some kind of similar for your brand and explain what explain why you chose those platforms. And this is what I get from a lot of people. Uh, and I kid you not. Uno is going to kill me with story posts. And then I will hear, I will have somebody say to me, like, um, um, visual platform with many features, uh, with visual platform with many features. What are features like what? What's the relevance of these features to your business? How does this help you? Guys, explain. And if you guys was looking at this document, you could have said something like this. Facebook has over 1 million monthly, local active monthly users from which we are sure or whatever, we can identify our target audience or something like that. You don't have to use my exact language. But for the fact that there are over 1 million Jamaicans on Facebook, it means that Jamaicans are using Facebook and you are certain because you did some kind of research that among that 1 million persons, you will find your target audience. Furthermore, 
Facebook has features like Facebook groups where we're going to um that we're going to create to connect and stay in touch with our existing customers and new um, customers and Facebook Live where we're going to be giving tips and tutorials and blah 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 or Facebook this and Facebook blah 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 blah. That's what I expect, guys, because you're explaining why you're choosing these platforms. And if we go back here, I asked, I said, I gave you guys examples of what you need to consider. The role you would play in your marketing strategy. Where, so if live, if a live, if you're gonna do live streams and these platforms have live stream features, then they are gonna play a role in your strategy, right? Where your target audience will most likely be. Functions and features of each platform and how they work and how you can use them to enhance your brand profile. How you will differentiate your content on different brands and how your brand will look and so on different platforms. Guys, I am convinced that if you guys had read this through and processed it, I wouldn't have got what I got right here so, with these kinds of things. Yeah. So guys, that's some of what I expect. I chose Instagram because something about my audience and it's easier to connect because of Instagram DMs or we find that we get more, more traction with Instagram stories or I expect an explanation as to why you think this platform will serve you best. Make sense? Makes sense. I'm going to take questions, guys. So use the rate and feature. If there's anything you don't understand, I'll take question. Coming down to here, social media engagement plan. Mm -mm 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 -mm. This hurt. This hurt to my spirit. Let me tell you why. The instructions were. The instructions were. Outline one to two par a one to two paragraph plan on how you'll be using. I'm even telling them on how you will be using social media to engage your audience. I'm going to get bullet points. I'm going to get people explaining to me instead of telling me. So I'll get people say, um, like, uh, we are going to use social media to engage with our audience because it is the quickest way that we can engage with our audience. And we doesn't tell me anything. So let's 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 work through. Let's talk about what our social media engagement plan is. What do I mean by an engagement plan, guys? I told you guys here, you know, developing a social media engagement plan. And I said, how do you know if your social media efforts are paying off? Engagement. More important than having a large following, having an active and engaged audience. And I go blah 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 blah. And I said the last line is. Um, engaged audience is the best lead generation tool because they can extend brand reach tenfold, which leads to greater awareness. And if your profile and content is right, interest with is, is right, interest which leads to back to more of the referrals. I don't even know what I was saying there. Oh, I was I was saying if the profile and content is right, comma, it will generate interest, which leads right back to more of the referrals. My man. So it says, what is social media engagement? And I explain, guys, I explain, okay? How your audience interact with your brand, such as comments, likes, shares, and posts lead up to a reaction. It also takes into account, blah, 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 your brand, your brand. I really need a proofreader. Can also benefit from engagement generated by blah, 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 blah. Guys, there were three slides, three slides where I explained all of this. And I ended, I ended, and look, look, how to increase social media engagement. This is based on what I do for Digital Jamaica. Strategize, reciprocity, signature content. I was hoping you guys would have honed in on that. Community incentives. I was hoping you guys would have honed in on that. And becoming audience-centric. So right here, so now what would I, I would have expected you guys to say something like, 
our social media, we are going to create a specific type of content for our platform. And the purpose of this content is to blah, 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 blah. Of course, that's going to be something around engagement. Yeah. And to um, incentivize our audience to engage with this type of content, this is what we are going to be doing. I'll give you an example. Digital Jamaica, we created the Digital Jamaica People to Watch series. What is the series about? It is a community-based series where we look at our community, we look at the persons in the community who are doing a particular set of things, six categories, right? And we put them on a list. Each year we publish that list and what that list is meant to do is highlight or, or spotlight these people, yeah? And it's telling the community that these are the people that we need to support. Although, let me not use that example because I think that's a better example of a community plan. So let me use a different example about an engagement plan. And I tell you guys about this all the time. Or a hashtag engagement. Um, we have a hashtag um, contact campaign that we do called On Our Timeline. And what we do is by the, at the end of the week, each week, we uh, go through our community and we look at what our community is doing. And then we share that on our, on our, in our stories and it generates a lot of engagement because we are using our platform to promote our community members and it generates engagement and it generates reach because people share, we tag them in it and they share it and people who follow them and like them will share it and it goes on exponentially. That's one engagement plan that we have. We have other programs and features on the platform that because we are, audience centric it tends to get a lot of engagement because people like to see and hear and talk about other people and the fact that somebody is talking positively about a brand you like you're going to want to share it the brand is one you're going to want to share because what social proofing for them free social proofing for them so they're going to want to share it and then they share it and then people them share it and people share it, people share it, people share it. so that is another engagement strategy that we have is to create content that is shareable because it is focused on the audience and it is provides social proofing for a certain kind of people that's something that i expect you guys to say in your engagement plan right type of content, what this content is supposed to do and how this content will generate engagement. Because guys, if we're talking about engagement, we must be talking about some activity that you're doing. And if you're talking about activity on social media, we must be talking about what? Content. We must be talking about content. Even the Instagram polls where all of us seem to be obsessed with, it's content. And I'll give you a pro tip, guys, and I think I've said this many times. Create feature content. And what do I mean by feature content? Content that you're going to be producing over and over and over again. Unbox therapy, only do one thing on their YouTube channel. And what is that? Unbox things. That's all they do. That's all they do. Right? So you can create a signature feature for your brand and people can now expect to come and see this feature every week and it will build engagement for your brand whether it's a podcast whether it's a live stream whatever it is so i expect you guys to tell me what kind of activities are you going to be doing on your social media platform that are going to um encourage people to engage and how you're going to incentivize that engagement, which is what we said here so. That's what I expect. And I expect actually the same thing for social media because we talk about how important your social media community is, right? How are you going to create that community? Why would those group of people come together to support your brand as a community? What are you going to be? You know, some people had some very good ideas. Like I see one, one, one um, group was talking about creating a reward system for their community. Some kind of rewards or membership program or something, no problem. How are you going to do that on social media? How are you going to do that on social media? So, Back to what I was saying earlier about Digital Jamaica, as I said, I think would fit best with a community plan. The Digital Jamaica People to Watch is, was a community um, strategy to build a community. 
So we have the People to Watch program and we have a referral program where the people that made the finalist list of our People to Watch program automatically get put in a referral program. So if anybody comes to us and say, hey, Kenya, hey, Digital Jamaica, we're looking for somebody who does so and so, I immediately pull up my People to Watch this and look at what it is that they do. And that's open to our community as well. I know who the persons are in my community that does a certain type of thing, and they're the only persons I will recommend. If somebody comes to me and say, who do you know that does this? I will recommend them because I know I have proof that they can do the thing. They're a part of my community. I've seen their work. That's how I build community on digital Jamaica. Right? So guys, that's what I expect you to tell me. What are the activities you're going to be doing on your social media platform that is going to help you build a community around your brand? That's all I need you guys to say. It could be one line, it could be two lines. I said one to two paragraphs, right? So you don't have to go into you know elaborate details, but explain. So if you guys say you're going to create a membership program, fine. How will this membership program work on social media? Well, we're going to put out a call. We're going to let people know that we're going to be you know, doing this membership program for you to be, for you to access this membership program. You have to be a part of the community. These are the benefits of the membership program to the, the community. And these are the activities that we're going to be doing online as a part of that program for our community. That's the kind of thing I expect. Um, right, guys? Right, so this is this part of the assignment, but there was another part of your assignment. Before I leave this part of the assignment though, let me collapse this, let me bring back. And I'm gonna take some questions now. Um, it was KFC Antipas. Somebody said we read it over and over in our group. So guys, is it that? Okay, I'm gonna use Ray's hand and let's see some people read. Tar Tarin, go ahead. Do you have something to say? Tarin? Guys, raise hand if you have questions. Tarin? Not hearing from Tarin. Tarin? No, okay. Dennis? You can unmute, Dennis. Dennis? Why are you guys raising your hand if you don't want to talk to me? Guys, do you have any questions about something that I just said? Nope. Guys, you have no questions about what I just said. You see, guys, this is a, this is this is one of the frustrating things because we're in class, we talk, you guys say you have no questions. We have office hours, you guys don't ask ask questions, and then you give an assignment, and then when you get an unfavorable grade you get stroppy. All right, no problem. Anika Johnson, go ahead. Anika, go ahead. Okay, yes, yeah, so I'm from group seven mm -hmm. and I'm just looking at our um, PowerPoint that we did and okay. we um, outlined what we envision to be a uh, or engagement plan, that's the segment I'm asking about. But then there's the part that asks about the outline. So we did the outline separately from, say, the slides that correspond to the outline. So it's kind of just a summary or a bullet points of the different part? elements. Pardon? Sorry, I didn't understand what you just said. You say you did the outline separately from what? All right, so um, you want to bring up your slide? Okay, see, I don't because uh, can you? Is it on my? 
Alright, that's fine. Right. Just explain sure. what you just said. On my desktop. Yes. So I was saying that um in terms of the the engagement plan, it asks for an outline. Mm -hmm. So we had some bullet points referring to the outline itself, but we also had the slides that related to that. No, guys, I know I, I get this explanation all the time. You, understand. you can't tell me about related slides. I'm talking about the slides that gave a particular instruction. There was a group that I asked in, in the assignment number one, they were supposed to talk about who their target audience is. They had no slide for target audience and they told me but they mentioned it elsewhere. No, you had a particular instruction to do a thing. So do that thing. Even if it's mentioned elsewhere, there's a particular instruction to do that particular thing. So it can't be a oh, part of something else. It has to, you have to do this. No, that's not what I'm No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. <clears throat> that's not what I'm saying. Right. I was following your outline. And then okay. based on the questions regarding the engagement plan, we had the corresponding slides. And then after that, it says- What do you mean by corresponding slides? I don't understand. Okay, the slides relating to, okay. It, the question asked us for the, I'm trying to go back to the original question where it asked us to, to have an engagement outline plan, Outline one to right? two paragraph plan on how you will be using social media to engage your audience. Yes, and we have that. We have the slides, and then our outline itself is just some bullet slides. If you understand, then it cannot be an outline if it's bullet points. But we have the slides, so the slides you should have a be. Book. If it's a book of bullet points, you didn't do what I asked you to do, which was to outline. And why would you have separate slides with bullet points instead of just creating the outline and just done? You gave yourself extra work to do, and none of it is what I asked. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to see if I can pull it up because pull I it up and show that, me. Let me try. Save to so many things. Yeah, do you want me to open it since I have it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Please do. Let me let me share my screen and open it. Okay. Anita, thank you. I'm gonna come back to you. Let me go to add money. Money, what are no you problem. saying? Hi, afternoon, everyone. You hearing me? I'm hearing your money. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to have an idea of uh, but that you're going through the assignments. You went through the assignment with group one on Friday. Um, I was wondering if we are, well, obviously then we'd get a chance to edit them, but what time frame are we looking at? We're not reach us yet, honey. Resubmit. <laughs> Okay. You're jumping ahead. When I reach you, say it. All right. Okay. Yeah, man. And I, I did say it in the voice note, but I'll say it again. Let me let me share my screen. Guys, no, I don't want to. This is not a, to, 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 you know, beat up on group seven, but I see a lot of you guys do it. Guys, when you do it this way, how will I know which one of these things I'm supposed to mark? I gave an instruction from day one about how I want you to label your assignments when you upload them to the drive. And very few groups do it. And so I come in and I see things like this and I have to keep opening them to look at what the full title of the thing is to know which one I'm supposed to mark. Some of them is the exact same thing, but I'm in bracket number one or in bracket number two and I don't know which one you guys want me to mark. That's one. The other thing too is, no matter how many times I've said to you guys, do not resolve my comments. Do not resolve my comments. Do not trouble the comments. You guys resolve the comments. No matter how many times I've said it. No matter how many times I've said, guys, the original one that I have the feedback on, it needs to stay in your folder because I reference it when I'm marking your final submission. Delete it. Gone. So I think one of the biggest issues I have had is that you guys don't listen and you guys don't read carefully. Not that you don't read, but you don't read carefully. And sometimes the mistakes that you make in your assignment are careless mistakes that if you had just read the thing properly, you wouldn't have had that problem. 
No, group seven, send me to them for up to pull up something. You guys tell me now which one of these things I'm supposed to pull up. So you know what I'm gonna have to do? I'm gonna have to do this. That's week one. This is week one. This is week two, but this says social media plan. I don't know what, I, I don't know what that is. And this is week one. So, so now guys, I'm in a situation where I actually don't know which one of these things I'm actually supposed to be looking at. I'm assuming it's this one because it says assignment two. But look at how, look, look, first of all, it's assignment two, group seven, week two. But then look at how it is structured. So now I'm going to have to then to go to group seven and say, group seven, is this the one I'm actually supposed to be marking? Right? So I'm assuming this is it. I don't know what these things are. I, I did not ask group seven for any of these things. I don't know what these things are. Choosing SM platforms. I guess they've redesigned it. But again, I asked them to explain why and I got bullet points. I think this is what Anika was talking about, bullet points. I mean, this is not bad, but all you tell me is, Client testimonial videos, video tutorials, images of before and after. The question I'm going to ask is how is any of this relevant to your brand? That's the question I'm going to ask because you actually didn't say why this type of content. You never said that. Interacting with our audience through replies and comments. Guys, if you're telling me you're interacting with your audience, I'm not sharing, am I? Am I sharing? Yes, I'm sharing. Okay. Guys, if you tell me that interacting with your audience through replies and comments, my, my, my response is going to be, duh. Duh. <laughs> you, that's not special, or is that even worth mentioning that you're going to reply? Partner with macro and micro influencers to grow our community, namely, okay, how are these people relevant to your brand and how are they going to help you grow your community you guys could have given me a one or a two line explaining that because you guys could have said partner with macro and micro influencers such as to grow our community and then post up and then you say x influencer has x amount of followers and the type of followers she has the type of followers we're trying to get in front of something that will explain to me how any of these persons are relevant to your brand. What you are doing is you are leaving it up to me to assume. You don't want to do that. You don't leave it up to anybody else to assume. You be clear as to what you are saying. But these are actually not bad. You just need to condense this now into one to two paragraphs explaining the relevance of all of these things that you would have put it here. And you guys give yourself unnecessary work to do because all of this, I didn't ask for all of this. Literally, it says the instructions literally said one to two paragraph plan, that's it. Now we're at three slides, four slides, five slides, six, seven slides. And you guys still haven't actually done what I asked you to do. And then you see, when I mark it and I say, you guys actually haven't done what I asked you to do, people get upset, but this is what I'm talking about. All of this is really good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this isn't good. I'm glad that you guys thought this thing through. This should have been your draft. And from this, somebody should have summarized and given the one to two paragraph. Good ideas. Don't get me wrong. Some of this is actually pretty good. Summarize, put it in there. That's, that's what I asked. So I hope that was helpful, um, Anika. Let me kick off. I know you have, you have pretty good ideas, but summarize. 
one to two paragraphs. Guys, the instructions, you have to follow the instructions. Yeah? All right, let me see. Any other hands? Sure, Anika, no problem. So guys, again, remember, I can only mark what I see on the paper. And if you guys don't provide adequate explanations, if you guys just drop down an obscure thing, like a one line thing, and you're leaving it up to me to figure out what you're talking about. And I, I'm not going to do that because if this was in the real world, your client wouldn't be sitting there trying to figure out what you're talking about. You're just going to move on to the next person. You have to be abundantly clear. Uh, Tenage, go ahead. Hello, Miss. Are you hearing me? I'm hearing you. Okay. So thank you again for your feedback from for Group 7. It's still related to Group 7. You were saying that you did not know which one to open as relates to the project. Are you coming on here to defend this? Really? That's what no, you no, no. No, I'm not here to defend this. Actually, I wanted to show you how you could. The way I saw it is different than the way you're seeing it. That's why also I thought that you could have seen it clearly as relates to because you can choose to see it as an image or choose to see it as a list. So I thought you would have seen it because I was seeing it as a list. See it as an image or choose to see what is an image or a list. What do you mean? As in the project on the drive. You can see, you know, just like with folders, you can choose to see the folders, pictures, or see the folder as lists. So I thought we thought that you could see it because we put you have um, for example, you would give us assignment one. And then you said you were supposed to resubmit assignment one. We put it as final submission, assignment one final. So that's why I thought Except it I was done. Except I asked you to resubmit and name it as amended assignment number one. Oh, amended. Okay. That's what the voice says. It's what I'm saying. You guys are not listening or reading carefully. You're not listening carefully and not reading clear carefully. And that is what causes the confusion. Guys, I have 25 groups. I just need to come in and see what I need to see so I can mark and move on. But if I'm having to come to the group to say, hey, guys, which one should I mark and blah, blah, blah. It, 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 it delays everything, guys. It delays everything. Okay. So that's all I'm saying, um, Tenergy. All right. Then. Any, yeah, Thank you so any, much for the clarity. Sure, no problem. Any any other question, guys? I want to move on quickly. We have six minutes left in the class. Before I go, uh, could you just um, guide us as it relates to the content calendar? That's that's assignment number three. We're going to do that on Wednesday. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're going to go through content calendars on Wednesday for a okay. good 30 minutes because I am surprised that persons don't know how to fill in a content calendar. And I'm surprised because even if you've never filled in a content calendar before, it's a calendar. And I've seen some things in Jesus' name. All right, guys. Thanks, Tenerje. Uh, and I gave you an example of one. And, and guys, the, the example of one I give you in the photo is probably not even the best example I could have given you because you can include photos and links and all sorts of things in your content calendar. Before I go to the juicy news, let me quickly go through the platform strategy. And since Group 7 volunteered themselves, we're going to use Group 7 as an example. Sorry, Group 7. So let's look at Group 7's platform strategy, which they have not done. They have, okay, here it is again, guys. So average age is 23 to, 23 to 29. Tertiary, corporate professional, make this amount of money, metropolitan cities, okay? And then, Guys, I gave you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight lines down the still each top in a one can, nine a bullet pine. All I want to do is everything I want to do. It. Why? Why? So pain points. 
impersonal services. Okay. Lack of responsiveness from companies when inquiring about products for purchase. Products that contain chemicals. Purchases that are not online that have complicated processes. The only thing that makes sense to me right here, sir, is products that contain chemicals. Guys, you have some problems that are perennial problems that any business will face, like probably customer service issues because of the market that we're in. So when you're going to pinpoint that as a pain point, and that is why you went and created a whole beauty line, that makes no sense. That makes absolutely no sense. The pain point, the problem has to be directly related to the core, at the core of why you created this brand. Customer service, unless you're creating a customer service-based business, cannot be the core of why you're creating a new brand. Everybody told me that, or most people told me that, and that just don't make Impersonal service cannot be the reason why you created a whole new line of products. It's not even like it's a service you're offering, group service, you're offering a product. This don't make any sense. So products that contain chemicals, I understand. Elaborate on that. What is the problem they are having with products that contain chemicals? Give me at least a paragraph. At least a paragraph. Explaining what is the problem they're having with products with chemicals. All right? So now, where are they online? Notice. Group 7 only talked about Facebook and Instagram. Yet, when they came here, so they said them everywhere. Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok. Then why is Facebook and Instagram your primary platform? What makes Facebook and Instagram your primary platform? That's what I want you guys to tell me. Because you admit that you have audience on other platforms too. So what make these two platforms the main ones, right? All right. What do they do online? Everything except study, apparently. But when I ask you what your audience do online, I'm asking about the main things that they do online, especially the things that they do online that will be relevant information for your brand. Like they reshare feed content or they visit their favorite website because it could be a blog. Because if you have people who are into beauty or products, more than likely they have a favorite blog, a favorite beauty blogger, or beauty YouTuber that every day they're going to watch their content or something. That's relevant information for you to know because you can go, oh, they like this influencer. Maybe I need to get my brand in front of this audience through this influencer. So this is relevant information for you to know. That's what I meant by what do they do online, right? What kind of content do they share online is also about what content they share online that's relevant to you. So if it's blog, beauty, lifestyle, health, and wellness, that makes sense. If it's videos, make product reviews, blah, 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 this makes sense. Okay, so here, guys, I think you did a good job in these two sections where it kind of match, it correlates, because if it, you're a beauty brand, so now your audience must be into beauty, right, and a certain type of beauty. So you guys could have even gone further to say that they're into uh, uh, blog organic beauty or something, and that's the kind of content they look for. But, but this is good. This is fine. Personas. You guys name your personas. Guys, if you're a B2B business, your persona could be a brand. It could be another business. It could be a brand. You can create a brand persona, right? So persona A is Nicole. There's no persona B for some reason. Don't know why. Persona A is Nicole. Nicole is 26 and she's a marketing coordinator. What is her interest? She likes hanging with friends, exercising, reading, and self-care. No, guys, if you're a beauty brand, when I ask you for your persona, if you read what this says, an audience persona is a detailed day in the life of narrative about an individual that represents your target group. Now, if you're a beauty brand, this individual that represents a target group, how come her mo the, the thing that she's most interested in is not self-care? How come self-care is the last thing she's interested in? 
So more than anything else, she prefer hang out with her friends, exercise and read than actual self-care. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then social groups, Kiwanis Club, Express Fitness. Christian is a social group. I did not know that Christian was a social group. And, and I'm gonna go there. Do you think that somebody who's a Christian and that's a part of her social group and it's important enough that she's gonna list that she's a Christian? How much beauty brands and stuff will that person be interested in? Now, you guys are gonna have to make that correlation. Because depending on the religion, that should not, for, for, for a lot of women in certain religions, beauty is not central to that religion at all. So you guys, only go put Christian beer, so no, only have to go make that correlation. Why is that such an integral part of your target audience? What is the correlation between that and beauty, right? Not saying it is not. I'm just saying you have to make the correlation. So because you only had one person, I guess you only did one of this. And then down here, you know, you said digital competence. They shop online, they bank online, they use mobile apps. What types of apps? Streaming services, example, Netflix. Banking, online shopping, example, Amazon. There are iPhone users and they do store parties online. So I said primary online users, you know, primary search engine Google. So that's fine. So guys, when you're going through, what I ask questions like, what do they do online? What kind of content do they do? And I do encourage you to have two persona types because even though you're talking about um, one person that represents the group, you could have a primary group, a secondary group, even you well, let's let's backtrack. You could have a primary group, but within that group, there are some nuances that maybe differentiate, right? And so you can have primary groups and secondary groups. So you can have persona A, which is probably your primary group, and persona B, which is your secondary group. You guys need to say that. Okay. Um, if you are a B2B, brand to brand, let's go over it if you are a B2B and look at how you could have done this. So who are they? Um, here now, you could talk about the owner of the business, is that female owner, what's the average age, education level, occupation, you could say CEO, salary, blah, 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 blah. So you guys could have put um, that she's the CEO of the company. You guys can always amend these um, templates to how you want so it makes sense for what you are doing. Don't be afraid to do that, right? Pain point, what is the problem this business or brand has that your product or service as a B2B company is solving? That could be there. It could be that they have a problem with the messaging about their brand, they have a problem, whatever, depending on the type of product or service that you're providing. Where, where are they online? Meaning where online does this brand or business have a presence? You could put that there. Um, when do they publish or whatever on their platforms? You could put that there. Um, what do they do online could translate to what do they publish online, right? What type of content do they share online? Again, publish online. Um, this could also be what kind of content the brand interacts with online. So I'm just giving you some ways you could, um, you know, kind of make this fit as a B2B. Personas. You could have Digicel, you could have Flow, Persona A, Persona B. For interest, you could talk about some of the things that they talk about in terms of what are they talking about on their platform. So if they're talking about football, or you could even look at their social responsibility arm and look at what they're talking about. Um, in terms of social groups, in in, instead of social groups, you could talk about whether they are... Again, you could look at their social media responsibility. You could look at who they are affiliated with. Are they a part of like the Jamaica Manufacturers Association or the Jamaica Exporters Association? Those are groups, right? Um, interest, you could talk about, are, do they get involved in politics? Do they talk about politics on their platform? Is that an interest that they have? Is that something that they share? Um, are they into social issues? Stuff like that. So this is kind of how, guys, you could use this. Um, here, you could talk about if they, are, if they have an online shopping um, feature. Um, 
if they have a mobile app is the app on android or iphone again guys all of this could be customized if you're a b2b um kind of business so guys that's how you would do that if you're a b2b business i hope that makes sense are there any questions is there any raised hands any questions guys <laughs> 